This episode of The Sean Ryan Show is brought to you by Vigilance Elite Patreon. Vigilance Elite Patreon is how you support the show. It also has an entire library of tactical training and behind-the-scenes footage of The Sean Ryan Show. Go to VigilanceElite.com, click the Training tab. It'll take you right to Vigilance Elite Training on Patreon. Get a subscription, support the show. Thank you. Let's get on with it. We were all told to stuff a superstore is on fire, and we all knew that that was a horrible place to have a fire. We re often referred to that as a, as a death trap. And It's one thing when you got a dead body there that you can recognize, but when you know it's one of yours and you don't know who the fuck it is. Welcome back to The Sean Ryan Show. I want to kick things off by saying thank you for the overwhelming response we've received on Patreon since the last show. We now have over 80 videos of exclusive content for our patrons, and the live chats have been pretty cool too. Also, thank you for all the iTunes reviews. Every single show we've released has been in the top 100 in society and culture on iTunes, and that's because of those reviews. If you haven't yet, and you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, please leave us a review, leave at least one word in the comments section. That's what takes the show to the next level. Where'd you get that hat? VigilanceElite.com. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Roger that. See you later. And now for my next guest. He's a Marine Corps veteran, a firefighter, a police officer, a stand-up comedian, and a stand-up human, an author, and now motivational speaker. Ladies and gents, we have been looking for the perfect firefighter to bring on this show for over a year now, and we finally have found one. He was part of the Sofa Superstore fire in Charleston, South Carolina, which is one of the deadliest fires to ever take place in the United States. He is going to tell us his story and how he moved past his inner demons. At the end of this, we have created a firefighter hat, Vigilance Elite, firefighter hat which we have for sale and are donating all of the proceeds to a firefighter charity of his choice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Travis House. Travis House, welcome to the Sean Ryan Show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Me too. I'm excited you're here. I've been wanting to get a firefighter on for Ever since I've been doing this, I've been kind of looking for someone that's a right fit, uh, that's a firefighter. And um, I put a couple feelers out and it was always, they were they just kept sending me, this firefighter was a SEAL or this firefighter was a Marine or this. And I didn't want to focus on the veteran stuff or the mill stuff. I wanted to focus on uh, the actual, you know, being a firefighter. 
And uh, because I know you guys see a lot of traumatic stuff and and um, I think uh, you're another occupation that's extremely underappreciated by the general population. And um, so anyways, you reached out, we connected, and uh, I think you are the perfect fit uh, to be here. So thank you for coming. That's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> Is thank that a tear? Yes, it's just a little one. All so right. Don't make me cry too much. Over. No, it, cer it certainly is my pleasure to be here. I'm certainly an honor. I love what you guys do, and it's just to be a part of it, it, it means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I did a, a bunch of research on you, and uh, I kind of talked about that in the warm-up, but, you know, he got a new book out, read that, Um listen to your podcast. And then because I don't really know anything about being a firefighter, I did, uh, I researched, I spent some time researching kind of, uh, you know, what you guys go through on the day to day type stuff and, and kind of the camaraderie and, and, uh, got as good of a feel as I think I would get by watching videos and, and talking to friends. But, uh, in your background, you've had a lot of careers. Yeah. You, uh, <laughs> Out of high, right out of high school, you went in the Marine Corps. Then you became a firefighter. Then you were a police officer. Mm -hmm. Firefighter again, stand-up comedian, motivational speaker, author. And I mean, then, then as I researched you a little bit more, I found out that uh, you were a limousine driver. Oh no, I was a limousine owner. A limousine owner. Well, you didn't I mean, drive I drove, a limo. I did drive too, but. I'll so bet you short, some good stories of shit that was going on in the back of that limo. So all my all my drivers were cops and firefighters, and I certainly have some good stories. Some <laughs> stories that would make some people lose their jobs. <laughs> Hell yeah. Nice. And uh, what I was really surprised about is I, I had no idea that you are a survival expert. Oh, you found that out? I did, did not you? know that. And, uh, you know, so I want to go ahead and roll the tape of what I found. Oh, uh, all right. Hey, it's Travis Howes. I'm out here in the desert in Nevada. Uh, I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran, so I like to consider myself kind of a survival expert in different climates. Yes. Right now, I'm going to show you just really quick how you can get water from a cactus. Just any any average Joe can get water from a cactus. Anybody. What you're going to do is you're going to go down to the cactus, and you're going to just reach in, pull out your bottle of water, Perfect, man. Any of you guys can do this. Stay safe out there. Stay hydrated. Dasani. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you dug that. You dug that out of the archives. Man. I did. I did. You know, and had I not, uh, I would still be wondering how the fuck I'm going to get water out of a cactus if I, you know, wind up in a desert somewhere. You know what's so funny about that video? Um, I was doing comedy out in Laughlin, Nevada, and that was in the Grapevine Canyon. And I went out hiking one day, and I was dying. And I never really got into putting pumping content and all this. And I walked by this big ass cactus and I was thinking, man, people, you can survive off of these. And I had a bottle of water and it was just impromptu. But what gets me is I did that video just to have fun. And the hate, if you go into comments, these people are talking about your mother hates you. <laughs> all this, like, come on. All Where's these, your sense of humor, yeah, fucker? You all know? the keyboard commando you Yeah, there's some Marine clowns. you were. Like, come on. Like, they don't teach us that shit yeah. in Marines. We get MREs Man. and canteens, water buffaloes with water. We don't have to go search forage for it. The, uh, I mean, I can't, like, how low is their intelligence level to not realize that is a fucking joke? Wait, it, it is a joke, right? Yeah. I'm a, Look, I'm a dumb bastard. I barely got through high school and... I could understand that's a joke. So I do not understand if people can watch that and take it so seriously. But, I mean, you know, you pump content, you know. Yeah, I totally get it. But uh, for those of you listening, you can check out his YouTube. There is a ton of solid survival information on there. Oh, yeah. That, uh, you know, you, you're going to learn a lot. I got into that for a little while, and then I got bored with it and quit doing it, man. But you know what? You might have reinvigorated me. I might need to go out and start making some survival videos again. The Naked and Afraid one is— You uh, saw that one, too? I saw all of them. I forgot, man. You you, you do research. I feel like now that you were saying this, like I feel like I was passing a background test for law enforcement just to get on this damn show. <laughs>
But, uh, and you know, you're a new author. And yeah. uh, how long has your book been out? Uh, two months. It came out May 25th. Right on. Yeah. Well, uh, you never were into reading or writing, you said. So, nope. And uh, being a survival expert and a, and a, and an author, I always give everybody a gift that comes oh. here. So, I got you a little something, you know. What's in the box? No peeking. Let's see that. Let's see. Oh, sweet. Little survival hat for you. I saw your hat the other yeah. day and I was thinking about asking you for one, so this works out. Yeah, you know. And you can't, uh, hey, the gummy some, bears. Some survival rations for you. Dude, you will never go hungry or you never go without the proper calories without these. Yeah. I'll keep these in my cargo pockets <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Right on. And if you ever run Thank out, you. you know, you can just hit the website. And uh, there's all kinds of survival stuff on there. Survival so if I shirts. run out of gummy bears, can, is it safe to say, ask you, do you have some? Yeah. I, I got a couple. A little inside. Just here. a couple bags. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much. I'll give you the box back. Everybody gives me the box back. I don't know why. Every, I've given this box to... I can't take it on the plane. That kind of sounds thing. weird. Let me give you my box I'm back. i to stop that conversation right now. <laughs> Oh, but, this is cool. uh, Thank you. And it's my color too. I and, love my black. You know, since you're a new author, I picked up a book for you. You might want to read that. There's oh, really good writing style. I like that writing style that this guy used to write this book. So, and I know cupcakes. how much you like cupcakes. <laughs> so. I love it. Did you wrap this? My wife did. Okay, I was about to say. Damn, she wrapped this thing tight. Wait a second. Look at this. I got my own book for a present. Is it? I love it, man. Thank yeah. you. Create your own light. So. This is awesome. Yeah. You know. I, I don't even know what to say. I got my own book as a present. That was given to me by the author. And, uh, and it sucks so you bad know, you're giving it back? And uh, Well, I thought you might want to read it. So. <laughs> I'm just. But, <laughs> this is great, man. Anyways, you can. Uh, Get Create Your Own Light on Amazon, right? Yeah, so you can find this. That's kind of a cool surprise. Here, take it back, too. Thanks, Cupcake. Um, okay. Yeah, you can get it on Amazon, and uh, it's 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 a surprisingly doing very, very well. And I say surprisingly because I wrote this book just kind of for me um, about all the you know traumatic experiences I've had and how I dealt with getting over them. Um, I didn't expect to put it out there and for, for it to sell the way it is. Um, but it's it's getting you know we had a conversation it's it's getting into our communities and military emergency services pretty deeply and it's uh, getting a lot of great feedback from it so yeah I appreciate the support everybody's given the book it means a lot it's a good book and uh, you know there's a lot of heart and soul in there which is uh, which is cool you know I, I like the way you just wrote how you speak yeah and uh, and it's helping a lot of fucking people and um, you know and and. Even after that, you know, uh, when we first spoke or messaged, I think uh, you sent me the book and you were like, I don't know if you like reading or writing. I fucking hate it. And I wound up writing a book and I was like, yeah, right. But after talking to you, I, I actually believe you. I fucking hate reading. It's the worst. And I hate writing. And uh, it's, it's actually, it's so bad that people give me something and I'm just like, I mean, I'm just, I... Well, I'm not cool, going to read it, but cool I did. Part is, I did read that. I well, appreciate uh, it. Yeah, that's it's tough because people have given me books before, and they're like, "Read my book," and I'm like, "Fuck." Yeah, because I don't read. Yeah, the crazy thing is that I'm a marine, and I wrote this without crayons. And that's yeah. crazy. <laughs> and it's crazy. Everybody's like, "Well, but it's got lots of pictures." Yeah, and it's like, no, it's like there's there's some pictures, but uh, yeah, and the subtitles finding post traumatic purpose. Yeah, you know, we didn't I didn't say that. Um, but I, thanks for support. Thanks for reading it. It means a lot. My pleasure. And uh, so, yeah, if you want to pick up the book, it's on Amazon. Uh, it also inspired me because I've been wanting to write a book. And uh, if you can do it, <laughs> if I, can. I can do it. So, um, yes. and I mean that uh, in a good way. But it, for somebody else that doesn't like to read that wrote a book, I'm like, oh, I guess it is fucking possible. So maybe I will uh, get my ass in gear. So... 
reading that book and listening to your other podcasts, I mean, you have seen a metric fuck ton of trauma in your lifetime and uh, a ton of it. And even without, uh, you know, the, the, uh, your career as a law enforcement officer and, and even your childhood, uh, part of what I want to do with this podcast, is I want to squash a, uh, I guess it's not a rumor, but I get a ton of emails from firefighters and we kind of talked about this and it's almost like a, uh, every, how you measure up. And the emails always start, even with cops, and it's, I haven't fucking seen it, what you've seen, or I can't compare it to what you've seen or what you've done. And uh, I want to squash that fucking rumor right now. I can guarantee fucking to you that you have seen a hundred times the amount of traumatic shit that I have as a firefighter. And it is every fucking day, right where you live, and, uh, you know, uh, one thing uh, in the military when you're on ops and whatever, you know, we come home for me to go back and witness some of that stuff. I got to go to fucking Yemen or I got to go to Afghanistan or, or not witness, but see the locations that happen as a firefighter or as a police officer or a, a, a whatever, a first responder. The shit's happening right in your fucking hometown, right where you live, where your kids go to school. Uh, where your wife's going to the grocery store. And uh, I can't even imagine how many places there are in Charleston, South Carolina, that you've responded to and seen traumatic shit that you have to fucking drive by every day or every week or whatever. And um, anyways, got a little long-winded there, but I wanted to just put that out there. Picking up what you're putting down, man, it's... um no truer words. And, you know, like I told you, no matter what background you come from, whether you did 30 years in, in SEAL teams or you were a 20 year infantry, Marine, Army, police officer, firefighter, this isn't a competition about who's been through more. Yeah. Unfortunately, some people do experience more than others. Um, so I do have people that they reach out and they say, Travis, I, I've never experienced what you have. So I couldn't imagine. And I stop them there. I'm like, this isn't about you and me. This is just about your experiences and how you're handling your experiences with trauma and how trauma is affecting your life. Don't, don't try to wear my shoes. I'm not going to try to wear yours. Yeah. Trauma fucked me up. I was exposed to it. Like you said, uh, on a grand scale and it was at a very early age and it just never left my life. Um, so I've had to learn how to live and be successful with all of that going on. Um, and, it's, it's been a hard road to hoe. Yeah. But man, I, I'm, I'm in the happiest place I've ever been in my life right now. And that's what I like when I, you know, when I do these, these speeches and everything, I like to show people that no matter what is going on in your life, you too can find purpose and you, you can live a healthy and successful life again. Yeah. You just got to have the mindset to do it. Well, you're helping a, a ton of people. Um, your book says it all. Like I said, it's all heart and soul. And, uh, I mean, it's just awesome, you know, that you have found that happiness because you definitely fucking deserve it. But, uh, you know, and, and, and you do that through your book and, uh, and your stand up comedy and, and now your motivational speaking. And, um, anyways, so now I want to dive right in. Uh, and we're going to start with childhood, but, you know, not just you, but, your entire family on both sides uh, is no stranger to traumatic events. And just uh, what yesterday or the day before we were down uh, having lunch in the kitchen and, and uh, you had brought up a wallet yep. and uh, we were talking about, we were talking about pass down items. And uh, so, and you were worried that your daughters might not appreciate that wallet. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a story about that wallet? So that wallet, August 6, 1944. Fuck you, Sean. I, um, I've never gotten emotional talking about this. 
I don't know why I used to, I, I do jokes about it on stage, but I guess when you're talking about the meaning of it, it's a little bit different. Um, so that wallet was in my, uh, my grandfather's left breast pocket. And he, uh, he was in, in the Normandy invasion. Uh, he was with the Canadian army that, that grandfather was. And he was, uh, they hit Juneau beach alongside of uh, Utah beach and all that at the same time. I don't know what wave he was in, but he was up there in the front. From my understanding, he died when I was five. Um, but without that wallet, I wouldn't be here where my kids wouldn't be here. So what happened was, uh, later on after that invasion, um, that was in June, two months later in August, wherever his unit was in, was in Holland. And, uh, he took a German round to the chest and that wallet is the only reason he lived and was able to, you know, have his own family, which put me here. And I have that wallet and when you hold it up, there's a bullet hole going right through the middle of that motherfucker. And when you turn it around, you can see where the bullet changed its um, trajectory once it hit. And, uh, so I have that wallet with all of his war medals and everything. And uh, it's, it, it hangs on my wall underneath my medals and by my father's military stuff as well. And uh, I have the, the original telegram that the Canadian Army sent my grand, or my great-grandmother. Uh, it just says, your son, Earl Michaud, was sh shot in the chest in combat. Condition unknown. That's it. Holy August, shit. August 6, 1944. Wow. That's all it says. And it's just a reminder when I go in there and look to what, what, and not like I really need the reminder because I know, but it's just, it's, it's, it's such a special thing to me to see that and to know that my grandfather, you know, risked it all, you know, just so we could have, have a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's special. That's uh that's a hell of a pass down item, man. And, uh, I'm, I was actually going to say, you know, uh, if, if you're looking for a way to, you know, for that to resonate with your daughters, I would just say you you just said it, but I mean, your dad wouldn't be here. Was it your dad or your mom? My mother. Your mother wouldn't be yeah. here, which means you wouldn't fucking be here, which means your daughters wouldn't be yeah. here. And it's kind of crazy to think about it. You know, if it wasn't for a fucking wallet, right. um, you know, Wow. Well, I told you the funny part of that story. My tattoo right here, this is a, a big windmill, and that's one of the main symbols of Holland. My daughter's name is Holland because that's where my grandfather was shot. Damn. Holland. And these other flowers, these are poppies, my other daughter's poppy. But I used to do the joke on stage was um, I couldn't name my daughter Wallet <laughs> because that's a dumbass name. And then I would freak <laughs> out anytime you saw that Capital One commercial, what's in your wallet? <laughs> it wasn't my wallet. Holy shit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, so anyways, I wanted to bring that up. I, th I thought that was an amazing story. And uh, actually, I didn't realize he was in Normandy. And I actually have some beach sand from Normandy uh, that I've been wanting to frame. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give you some of it. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, I'll give you some of it. You Thank can, you, man. You know, do what you wow. what you need to I'll with put it. it. I'll put it right there with this stuff. Cool. But um, so moving on to your childhood. You were exposed to some very traumatic events at a very young age, and um, it sounds like it all kind of started with Little League. Yeah, um, I have some funny traumatic events in there. When I was run over by a golf cart when I was three, and in my book I talk about remembering very specific details, and I won't, you know, I'm not going to get long-winded about that, but trauma has a way of working its way into our brain and searing our brains like a cattle iron. You can remember very, very specific details about traumatic incidents dating back to as early as three years old for me. And I remember it being trapped underneath a golf cart. I could tell you the names of who, who were there. People, I can remember specific conversations, what I was wearing, which way that golf cart was traveling, the color of the golf cart. It is insane at the things you can remember in traumatic uh, events. Yeah, you just, remember that from three years old. Just the detail, yeah. And I put that in the book. And um, my my family and I never really talked about it. We joked about getting run over by a golf cart when I was little, but we never covered any details. And when I decided to write my book, I sat down with my mom and I told her, you know, look, I'm going to start as early as I can remember writing about trauma. And she she didn't think I could remember back that, that, long, or that long ago in my life. 
And I, I said, well, stop me if I'm wrong about the golf cart when I got ran over when we lived in the little trailer park when I was growing up. She said, okay. And when I was finished telling her and my father, they were like, wow. how do you remember that? I said, that's trauma. That's what trauma does to you. Um, but moving on from the golf cart. So I had a, had a, had a normal childhood. It was great and everything, but uh, trauma finds it, finds its way into your life sometimes. And for me, it all started when I was in a uh, little league baseball, one of my best friends, um, his father was our little league coach. And, um, you know, I went camping with these people. I spent many, many, I spent the nights at, at his house and he spent the night at my house many times. And his dad was a tough guy, you know, and he was a, he was a, hard-nosed baseball coach. Everybody wanted to play on his team kind of thing. And he was a great dude. But one day my mom picks me up from school and told me that a uh, coach had just um, shot my friend, his son, and then shot uh, shot his wife in the face and then shot his, his uh, mother-in-law in the face and turned the gun on himself and, and blew his brains out. And uh, I was 11-ish around that time. And uh, I don't know when you're that young, you don't really understand the magnitude of that. Yeah. Um, fortunately, all the other folks lived. Um, but I just remember being really confused at an early age, like how violent this world could be and like, what do we do with that kind of information? And it wasn't long after that, that another friend of mine was, was shot with a high powered rifle in his chest and, and he was killed. His cousin shot him. And, um, yeah. Did you ever get a reason on why the, why your uh, friend's dad fucking? You know, that's their story to tell, kind yeah. of thing. And uh, but I believe it, it. It all boiled down to divorce. Wow. At, at the end of the at the end of the day, and um, I, I I'm very careful in that book to not put names and mm -hmm. to try to tell my side of it because of that because I wouldn't want somebody trying to tell my stories. Yeah. You know, these are mine and I just, I, I kind of go over it and um, yeah. paraphrase a little bit. So, uh, then when I was 14, you know, and they say when emergency services, a lot of people that go into military emergency services come from traumatic childhoods, whether it be, there's a very high percentage Sean. I don't know if it's, um, I don't know the percentage, but it's extremely high, whether it be sexual trauma, physical trauma, mental trauma, or actually experiencing traumatic events like my case. Um, when I was 14, I was exposed to possible sexual trauma. Mm -hmm. I ended up taking a summer job with a guy that owned a construction company, and he was a one-man show, and uh, he hired me. And I, I go over this in my book as well uh, in great detail on how this man would take me to these job sites. It was just he and I. And he would say these very derogatory things, and at 14, I didn't really understand the magnitude, and I couldn't grasp what he was trying to do, but what he was ultimately doing was trying to earn my trust and he would say very perverted things and uh, he never touched me or anything like that. But I think what he was doing, no, I know what he was doing was trying to earn my trust. And I was fortunate he hired another kid that I knew who was 17 years old. And I knew this kid very well as well. Um, he came onto the job and it was, then it was fun, you know, but the guy was still making the comments that he would make towards me. And uh, eventually got unco so uncomfortable, I quit. I didn't, I didn't want to work for him anymore. And literally about three weeks after I quit, the other the other kid, my friend, uh, committed suicide. Fuck. And nobody knows why. And that's only left to the imagination. No, I think we all know now. You know, and uh, I don't, I don't know, man. And it's, um, that was when I was 14 and uh, I'd already experienced all of that. Yeah. And so this has become a normal in my life now. Yeah. And so when I'm 15, I start hanging around the fire stations and I get, I get brought into this brotherhood. I experience it, you know, cause our, our middle school is right across the street from the firehouse. And I would often find myself in between bells running over just to have a conversation with, with the firemen. And I ended up knowing these firemen, getting to know them. I, I actually loved them because they would start breaking my balls when I'm in middle school and we're just having a good time. And I saw this family atmosphere that they had and I had a great home. I had a great family atmosphere. So it wasn't like I was looking for that because I didn't have it. I just saw these grown men fucking off at work and getting paid to do it and having a good time. And I was just drawn to it. Um, so at 15, I started hanging around there during the summers, you know, and, um, July 9th, 1993, 
was a day that I'll never forget um, because I, I was hanging out at the fire station and uh, during the summer. And uh, this firefighter, Ronnie Bergen, runs out and says, hey, kid, you want to go on a call? And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, I want to go on a call. You know, I'm, every kid wants to ride a fire truck, right? So, yeah. Yeah, that doesn't happen anymore because of, you know, laws and, and all these, you know, everything's in place to, you know, cover your ass. But back then it, it was it was very loose. So I hop on the truck with Ronnie. All I knew is that we were going to a, to a, a motor vehicle accident. But what I didn't realize is that was my very first call going to. And I can remember all the details because that very first call was also to the death of, a, of another firefighter. Yeah. Well, uh, what was it like when you got on scene there? It was horrible, man, and it was something I wasn't prepared to see at 15 years old. Um, it's, uh, his name was Sammy Singleton. He was he was also a Marine Corps veteran, and he was a brand new firefighter. And he worked for the, the city next to us. And I didn't know him personally, but when I got there, what happened is, is uh, there was a line of cars because there was a traffic accident ahead on a, on a little two lane bridge going from Beaufort, South Carolina, over to Bluffton, South Carolina. And Sammy was the last in line. He had just finished his shift and he was coming home from, from work. And uh, there was a hump in the bridge to let, you know, that, for a boat channel underneath. And Sammy was on one side of that hump and a concrete truck, mixer truck, was barreling down on them and, and couldn't see him. And when he came over that hump, he couldn't stop in time and he drove right over the back of Sammy's car. And his car was literally, when we got there, we had to get on our knees un and crawl to see it underneath. It was like it, it not only just drove over the top of it, but it's like it sucked it up into the frame. It was weird. And initially, right away, we didn't know that it was a firefighter. Um, but they soon found out when when they were able to pull that, pull that car free. And I was standing closer than me, about halfway from me to you, away from it the whole time while these guys were trying to get Sammy out of this car and he was he was a complete mess he was um something I can't even describe man yeah and at 15 years old when they all start passing the word that this is a firefighter you felt this heaviness just just come over the top of you yeah and you could see it affect these men these grown men these these were men amongst men and you could see the effect that it had on them and I immediately had that same feeling they had it was just heavy and you think you know you're like these are firemen they're yeah. here to protect people and they're out here getting getting killed like this um and i remember that that ride back to the firehouse it was very somber we didn't say a word and i could see ronnie's dead now but i could see his face still driving down the road just staring he had this blank stare on his face and at 15 i was trying to just understand understand this thing yeah. You know, I'm not trying to make you revisit every fucking thing that happened to you in your childhood, but I really wanted to kind of bring out, you know, how early yeah. uh, the traumatic events started uh, because it's such a big part of your story. And I also want to bring up the fact that, you know, all the shit that's going on nowadays and everybody's got a fucking excuse on why they're not successful or they can't fucking do this and they can't do that. I had a rough childhood. Shut the fuck up. You know, you're a yeah. living example of you didn't, you grew up poor, correct? Yep. And there's, and just 11 to 15 fucking years old, you've seen more trauma than most people will ever see in their entire life. So, uh, you know, if you can't make it happen, that's on you. You can come up with all the fucking excuses in the world you can think of. But right here is a living example of somebody who's dealt with traumatic events from a very early age, and uh, you're doing fucking great now. So um, I wanted to kind of highlight that and put that message out there. Well, thank you. But um, yeah, I talk about that extensively. You know, everybody wants to wants to point the finger, but nobody wants to turn that finger around and point him at, at themselves. Yeah, and. You know, you always hear this, you can do whatever you want, but it is, there's no uh, truer words. We, we are our worst fucking enemy. Once we get inside of our own head, that's yeah. the worst thing we can do. Anything is absolutely possible. And even after I hit the complete rock bottom, this is just scratching the surface of the stuff that I've had to go through that fucked me up later in life. And I was able to somehow turn it all around. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, 
fucking losers are great at finding excuses yeah. on why they're a fucking loser rather than putting the time in to figure out how to not be a loser. And uh, so anyways, I just wanted to uh, bring that up but, and uh, and uh, move forward now. But uh, so <clears throat> another thing that I kind of noticed, uh, and I think me and you are very similar in this aspect, but uh, going through your story, I kind of pick some things out. You were labeled class clown <laughs> yeah. in middle school and in high school. And it kind of sounds like you didn't really appreciate uh, that label. And in order to prove something, you joined the Marine Corps at, was it 17 18, years old? 18, 18 years yeah. old, right out of high school, right. joining the Marine Corps. Yeah. And uh, so is that is that why you joined the Marine Corps? Uh, that has a little bit to do with it, actually. I mean, it has a lot to do with it, but I also grew up right across from Marine Corps boot camp, Paris Island. And we played little league football over there, and we would see those recruits getting smoked by those drill instructors, and I was always like drawn to that. Not to mention, I watched Full Metal Jacket like three or four hundred fucking times, and I was like, <laughs> I gotta do this, I gotta do it. Um, yeah. So I got when I got class clown in eighth grade, I was like, all right, this is great, this is cool, and so uh, I was always a very fun, outgoing person, and that certainly carried on through high school, and I became the class clown in high school, but. My father wasn't too happy with that. Yeah. He was like, you know, this is this is what you do with our family name. What are you going to be a fucking comedian? And lo and behold, <laughs> right? Um, but you know, yeah, to try to show my father, I was, you know, I I had, I was kind of a man, and I could be, I could be a man if I needed to be. I joined the United States Marine Corps. Yeah. You know, and I I had something to prove to myself. I had something to prove to him, certainly. Um, not that, that he asked me to, but I felt this burning desire inside, you know, as, as I'm my father's son to show him that I'm worthy of carrying that title and, and I'm going to make him fucking proud. So, yeah. How'd that feel when you finally did? Fucking amazing. Yeah. yeah. Was he very proud? Yeah. I think he's always been proud of me, man. It's just, uh, that's, but that was certainly a special moment. Um, my father's not one of those to wear his feelings on his sleeves, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was certainly proud. Well, that's awesome. You know, um, would you say it played, you know, I mean, it definitely played a role in you joining. But then again, going through your book, um, I saw kind of like the same kind of thing, uh, maybe in the same wheelhouse happened again at your fire station when you uh, you wanted to do a comedy skit in front of everybody. <laughs> And uh, your friend Rob yeah. basically told you, you Kick fucking rocks. blow, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and you took that to heart. And uh, I'll be damned, you're doing stand-up comedy with fucking people like Kevin Hart. Yep. And uh, and uh, so anyways, I just, uh, I have that drive too. And uh, sometimes people's uh, perception of me is what, drives me when somebody says I can't do something. And uh, it seems like you're the exact same way. Tell me I can't do something. Fuck you. Watch this. <laughs> yeah. I don't care how long it takes. Hold my beer, motherfucker. Yeah, I will fucking get it done. It's getting done. Yeah. Um, And you do get it done, which is fucking awesome. There's no other way. Yep. Uh, it's a great feeling. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> to, fucking phenomenal. To prove people wrong like that. But... um. <clears throat> So I don't want to go too much into uh, your career as a Marine because um, your firefighting career is, is, is what really shines and, and, and stands out when it comes to uh, all the different services you've have, uh, served in. And um, so leaving the Marine Corps, you walked right into being a firefighter, correct? Yeah, man, I got out of that. So I did four years Marine Corps infantry, and then I got out in 2000. And uh, I was always intrigued by police as well. I wanted to I wanted to be a police officer, but I also wanted to be a fireman. And uh, I went back to my hometown when I got out of the Marine Corps and uh, went and talked with my buddy who was on the job there, and he walked me into the chief's office, and the chief remembered me from hanging around. My nickname was Scrotum. 
back in the day. So uh, when I walked in, my friend had said, you remember Travis? He's like, yeah, scrotum, come on in. So it's like, <laughs> oh, shit, man. <laughs> Firehouse is ball-busting ass place. I have no idea. I never pulled my balls out. I don't know why they called me scrotum. That's just the name that stuck. So I was I was known as scrotum. Uh, so he pretty much, you know, we, we had a conversation, and he told me, that uh, you know, he he had an opening, and he'd like to send me to the to the fire academy and everything. So that's what happened. I went to eight week fire academy, and I was on the job. I was doing it. Can you kind of? Uh, I am not familiar, you know, uh, with the life of a firefighter. So can you kind of walk us through? I wouldn't say like a typical day, but um, you know, what's it like when you're, you know, with the boys? Um, and I know you guys are super fucking tight. It's a brotherhood. And uh, at least while you're in, and we'll talk about that <laughs> yeah, later. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, can you kind of go through the feeling of when you get that call and you're at the firehouse and and you know it's it's something fucking real. It's yeah. it's going to be dangerous. You're going to see some, some horrific stuff. And uh, when does that... When does that adrenaline kind of start kicking in and what's the feeling and 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 kind of walk us through what that's like? All right. So when you your typical morning, when you come in at seven, eight o'clock, you just never know what the you know, you're on for a 24 hour shift. You never know what the day is going to bring you um, as a young guy. Of course, you want all the action. We all sign up to do these jobs because we want the adrenaline rushes. But over over a long, lengthy career. Those adrenaline, what we call them adrenaline dumps, it's the rush of getting that that hit of adrenaline and then the call turns out to be nothing and then it goes back down, mm -hmm. you know, and you just, you ride the highs and lows through a career and that's what, that kills a lot of people over the years, man, heart disease and gives them heart attacks. I mean, it, it will fuck you up. It rewires your entire fucking brain having that many adrenaline dumps. It it yes, it's fucking crazy. I, I paint, I do, I talk about a scenario, one call or one day on the job where we had multiple calls throughout the day, but all of a sudden, I remember one night in in my bed, and uh, we're, we're asleep, and you get rocked. You get up, you you jump on the rig. You're going to a hot call that you think is hot, and dispatch call says you're not needed. So you're like, fuck. You turn around, you go back to the firehouse, you back the truck in. Your heart rate's fucking 190 thousand beats a minute. You get back in your bed. You're trying to go to sleep. You can't go to sleep, and then you go off. You finally drift off to sleep, and bam, you get hit again, and you're back in the truck and you're hauling ass, and it turns out to be another alarm or a call that you're not needed on. So you come back to the house. Now it's two o'clock in the morning. You get back in the bed after about another hour, you finally doze off to sleep. Bam, you get hit again. And this is a real, real call that we went on. This is an exact scenario that's in my book. It was two something in the morning, Christmas Eve, and uh, we're going to a, 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 a fatal vehicle wreck. We didn't know it was fatal at the time. We pull up on the scene. Uh, a truck had f went off the road, flew through a, a telephone pole. It was upside down. Um, there's a guy sitting next to the bumper, just sitting there talking to himself. There's beer cans everywhere. And the, uh, the song, every rose has its thorn is on by poison. Mm. And I would never forget that because every time I hear that song, I can instantly smell this call. And the reason I say smell it is I smell the, uh, the grass that they hit and threw it, it flung mud everywhere. And then I smell the alcohol and the man's breath that I had to crawl up underneath some live hot power lines to pull him out from underneath they were about two two feet off the ground, and my my lieutenant's yelling at me to get back. And I just went. I had tunnel vision. I just saw a man that needed my help, and I went to get him. Um, and and he had agonal breathing. All of his teeth are busted out. He has massive facial trauma, and my face is really close to his because I'm I'm having to do a low profile drag to pull him out. And I can smell the beer emanating from his breath. So just from hearing that song, it takes me right back to that. Um, and man, he expired right there, pissed his pants and died. Damn. Um, so it's, it's stuff like that. And then when you get done with that call as a firefighter, firemen, we don't talk about this stuff. Yeah. We don't, we bury it. We go back to the house and you, you just fucking deal with it. Yeah. We gotta go get, we gotta go make breakfast now. Yeah. That's a typical day or you can show up and nothing happened and you're waiting all day and you're anticipating and it's, where's it at? Where's it at? Where, where's the call? Where's the call? And nothing ever happens. I mean, is it a good feeling? When nothing happens? No. When when something's happening, is it a good feeling? Man, so I've never done I've never done drug. I smoked marijuana twice in my whole life. Um but I would have to, from what I've heard about crack cocaine, 
I would think it's that kind of high. It's an immediate rush. Man. And you just can't get there fast enough. And what you have to be careful of, it's the tunnel vision, like I said, because that's what gets people hurt. Yeah. You got to keep an open mind frame yeah. and or mindset. And but your world gets very narrow real quick because you're seeing this emergency call the whole way, the approach to it when you get there. And afterwards, all that goes away, that euphoric feeling, that that high that you experience goes away. Do you crave it? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I'm trying to uh, put myself in your guys' shoes and, and uh, like, I wasn't planning on talking about tunnel vision, but, you know, it does fucking kill people. And, uh, and uh, I never really thought about tunnel vision and uh, an EMS or fire service capacity, but, you know, even being in a fucking gunfight, you know, if you have to be able to come off of your gun, look around, see what the fuck is going on around you. Um, and a lot of guys, um, especially that aren't in soft, they get that tunnel vision and it's, they're focused in on one, on one threat that's shooting at them and they don't see the 50 other threats, you know, that are in buildings. And, and, uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm, so I can totally relate. I know it can be hard to, you know, come off the immediate test and, and, and get a better understanding and some situational awareness of what everything, what else is going on in the big picture. The fog of war on emergency scene is the exact same. Yeah. You know, it's like you said, everybody's focusing on the burning building in front of them, but what they're not looking at is the fucking power lines that the pole is also burning and now that high power line's about to fall and, and land in a puddle of water because we all have water and whoever's standing in it's about to get lit the fuck up. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's stuff like that. It's the cars passing by on the street looking at the fire and that you're not watching the cars and the fucking dumbass driving the car is rubbernecking and runs over a fireman. Don't think that shit doesn't happen. It happens all the time. Yeah. You know, and it, it's shit like that. So yeah. you have to be able to see the whole picture. What's it like in the truck on the way to the call? Um, I try to put myself in those shoes and uh, that... Uh, for me was almost maybe even uh, more because it's the anticipation of you uh, uh, getting ready to do whatever you're going to do. And I, uh, I feel like it might be kind of similar to like us when we're in a helicopter and we're on the way to a fucking target, um, you know, and then you get that five minutes out, you get that one minute out, 30 seconds out, and every time hack, it's just like, <sighs> shit, like, it's fucking going down in 30 seconds, and then you're on the ground, and, uh, and, and, uh, sometimes things kind of, I don't want to say slow down, but you don't have fucking time to be nervous anymore. You, it's now it's, 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 it's all performance, and, uh, in the in the preparation, the mental preparation that you're giving yourself in the helo on the way to the target. What are you guys doing in the fire truck? You get in the fire truck. Uh, when do you find out what the fuck you're responding to? So that's that's the million dollar question, right? So what we're going off of, we're going off of information relayed from someone who's on scene with no emergency training, relaying that to a dispatcher who has emergency training, who in turn tries to paint a picture to us. We've been on tons of calls. And it's never like you think it is. It's 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 usually more fucked up than you can imagine. So it's eerily quiet on the way to call. So you hear the we're not all high fiving and dancing in the back of the thing. We're we're all getting into like our assignment mode, depending on what position I'm riding in the rig. If I'm a, a roof guy, if I'm a vent guy, you're listening to to that call, trying to what we call a scene size up. Uh, normally, the incident commander, whoever that is, the first arriving unit, tries to do a scene size up and paint you a beautiful picture of what's going on because now that is boots on the ground for us. That is the trained personnel, the professional who's been there, done it. And now they can paint you a Picasso of what the fuck you're coming into. And usually you're right, you're literally right behind them and right on top of them. So you only have a, like a, a few seconds to process that information. So if I hear, you know, we have a fully involved structure, fires vented through the roof, I know, okay, I'm a vent guy on a ladder truck, where the guys that go on the roof and cut the holes, mm. that's out the window right now. We don't need to do that, put the saws up. But if you hear 25% um, involvement, 
uh, we got we got people trapped. Now you're thinking, okay, instead of vent mode, I might have to go into re you know search and rescue mode because that's what we guys on the trucks do. I'm, I'm a truck guy, what we call a trucky, and we talked about that last night. Yeah. Engine company guys, they carry the hose, right, and they go in and put 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 the water put the fire out with water. The truck guys, we do search and rescue and ventilation operations where we try to expel all the toxic fumes and uh, the superheated gases from a structure. And we try to get that out to take a little pressure off of the guys with the with the um, hose company that goes in to put the fire out. So there can be multiple different assignments you're going into, and it's just very chaotic when you're getting there. So everybody's usually quiet, and then when we get there, we just figure it out, and we go, and it's game time. Wow. So you're doing as much, uh, you know, mission planning as you can on the way there? With the information that you're providing. Yeah. Yep. And you said usually it's more fucked up? Yeah, because you're going off of – you know, information that's relayed to you by untrained professionals and they don't know really what to look for, yeah. right? And being the civilians, you know? Okay. And then when you get there, it's there's usually a hundred other fucking things going on Shit. Then that, that they're not seeing. I'm talking on a really, really good hot call, not every oh. single call. Um, they just don't do a great job at painting the picture for us when it comes through the dispatcher. All we know is, hey, we got a, we got a fire um, that... That's all we know right now. But when you get there, you find out there's more to it. And it's a, it's a fucking fire. And on, on the backside, there's a pool, you know, and that's a threat to firemen because you can fucking drown. And that's part of that tunnel vision that I'm talking about. You're running around the back of a house, not paying attention. And your ass is in the bottom of a fucking pool carrying all this gear. Yeah. You know? Um, well, um, what's the first major fire that you responded to? Um, Hmm. Been to a lot of them. I don't this. Not June eighteenth, two thousand seven. Pick any other one, but you know, preferably like the first like major fire. I want to know, like, you know, I got it. What was the call? Did you think it was serious? And what was it like when you were in the fucking truck and? you finally see the smoke of where you're getting ready to respond to. Does that? Yeah. So the, the, the up? yeah, certainly the, uh, the first one was a two story house. It was an older house, probably built in the 1800s sometime around there. Um, we caught the call. And as soon as we left the station, uh, we got maybe a mile down the road, you could see the smoke and it was just big black smoke. This isn't white smoke like somebody burning yard debris. This is everything in the fucking world is on fire kind of smoke. Yeah. And it's pushing. It's got velocity behind it, which means you've got a, a big raging fire that's pumping that thing. Um, when we pull up, it was eating the ass off of the back of this house. I mean, half of the half of the back the back half of the house was was fully involved. And so we start flaking hose out and we run up to the front door. And this is I'm brand new. This is gonna be my first interior attack. And I hit my knees, I'm going to put my mask on and I'm reaching out for the door just to kind of push it open to get it ahead of us. And literally as I'm reaching out for the door, the rest of the house, the flames just instantly moved forward and just fl what we call flashed when everything reaches its combustible limit at one time. And it just whoo, completely out the front door, out the windows and right over our heads. And we're under this old time and porch and we have the hose line. We're like, oh shit. Yeah. You know, so now we have to back up. There's no going into this house. Yeah. Like the whole thing's on fire now. Right. So we back up. This is the first department I worked for my hometown department, which is a small department. We were severely, um, we were very small. We only had three stations. So you didn't have a lot of manpower when stuff like this happened. Um, and I just remember that was my first experience getting up on top of a fire, you know, like that close to a big, big fire and the amount of heat that it puts off. It's overwhelming. I mean, yeah. it backed us out of there so fast. And then we were doing what we call a defensive attack. And we started pulling bigger hose lines and we had to fight it from the outside. We didn't even get to get inside on that one. Yeah. Scale of one to 10, you pull up to something like that. What's your adrenaline at? 12. 12? If not higher. Yeah. Yeah. It's thumping, man. It gets fucking serious real it, fast. Real fast, yeah. Damn. The problem is, I think, as a young guy, you don't really understand the element of danger that's there. Yeah. You don't take it seriously. I mean, you do some, you get, you get pretty close to this thing. You, you hang out in places you shouldn't be hanging out in. Like I'm saying, when that fire's getting out of that whole house and, and licking the, the top of the porch, this two story porch that's over the top of you, that amount of fire, fire doubles in size every, I, I forgive me. I know some people are going to correct me, but every, every like 90 seconds or something like that fire doubles in size. Um, 
and I'm not looking for statistics here. I'm just saying. So we probably hung out under that porch play environment a little too long. Like, oh, yeah, bad, you motherfucker. You know, you're, yeah. you're out there getting after it. Like, this is what we do until it's like, hey, this shit's getting serious. We need to back up. But at any time, that porch could fall on top of you and kill you. Yeah. But when you're a young man, you're just getting after it. Yeah. It doesn't seem real. It seems, uh, again, it seems very similar. You know, the, yeah. you want to fucking work. That's what you train you know, even in, in you know in the teams at the agency, you know, if, if you're in a fucking gunfight, uh, it sounds weird, but there's nowhere else you would rather be than right, than there. right there in a fucking gunfight. Yeah, and uh, and going through your book and uh, and 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 listening to your content and talking to other guys, it seems like that's. Uh, the exact same thing with firefighters uh, is 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 someone like me in a gunfight. It's firefighters fucking fighting fire. Like it's dangerous as fuck. You wouldn't want to be anywhere else with anyone else. And uh, you know you're with your fucking brothers who eventually become your family. And uh, it's time to get some. Yep, yeah, it's time to get some. The but, sum is different, but it's yeah. time to get some. Yeah, yeah, that's all it is. <laughs> But uh, but you said so. Is that just the the younger guys that are newer, or does that kind of wear off? Um, it, it wears off as you get older, and certainly as um, you start to experience a lot of the things that I started to experience later in my career, because you realize just how real it is, and how fucking deadly it is, and how it can just change everybody's life. It's not just you; it's the people's houses. It's burning. It affects everybody, the community. It fucks people up, man. Yeah, and it's. It's it's fun because that's what you get paid to do. And like you said, you don't want to be anywhere else because that is your job. That's what you sign the fuck up to do. But as we get older and mature and you go through, like I say, the things we went through, you're still there to do the job, but you just don't wish it anymore. Well, we would sit around wishing and hoping for fires. Yeah. After my fucking friend, all my friends were killed, I never wished for another fire again. Yeah. It was like, if it happens, we go and we do our job. Yeah. But I'm not coming to work all motivated, man. I hope we fucking catch one today. Yeah. I hope we fucking don't because I don't want to be looking at my dead friends, burnt bodies and looking at their faces burn off of their fucking skulls. I don't want to do that again. Yeah. But if I have to, I will. I got another question. Um, so in combat, um, if somebody's killed in the in the line of duty, uh, there's a instantaneous feeling of you want to get fucking revenge, and you want to go after the people that fucking killed uh, your brother or your friend, your fucking teammate, and uh, you know, a lot of times that doesn't happen immediately, and you have to wait. But um, and it might be an, a, a completely it might be a completely different fucking organization, you know, but you get that. Uh, sometimes you get that feeling of like, yeah, fuck you. You got, you got mine and now I'm going to fucking get yours. But you guys don't, uh, I mean, when you lose somebody, where does that, where does that, uh, rage go? There's no get back. That's what I'm getting at. There is no get back. And it's unless somebody intentionally set a fire that killed your guys, then it's like, all right, let's go, let's hunt this motherfucker. But then realistically, we're not in war. Yeah. We're going to be held accountable for our actions if we go grab yeah. this motherfucker and kill him and anybody he fucking loves. Of course, we would have that mindset. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's consequences to those actions. I guess what I'm getting at is, is I, where's the energy go? You know, it goes into a bottle. Yeah. And you drink it down. And it goes into this this place inside of you that you try to bury it. Mm -hmm. There's no satisfaction. It's just all um, why, 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 yeah. constant whys. And it's the stacking effect of trauma. All this other trauma that you experienced stacks up. And now you take that and you put that on top of the pile too. Yeah. And there's nothing you can do with it because it just keeps stacking up. Yeah. And it fucks you up over time. Yeah, I mean, I, ju I just, uh, yeah, I was just, you know, um, it, it, 
it never leaves, you know, uh, me, I mean, it never leaves, but you do sometimes get that sense of like, um, I don't know what the fuck you call it, but, um, it's definitely not closure, but, um, you know, you, you, it's always with you, but you get that, I don't know, retribution maybe is the fucking word that I'm looking for, but I mean, you, you just, you guys are never going to feel that. I, I can't imagine you would ever, there would ever be a scenario where you're like, fuck it. You know what? Like you can't, it's a fuck. It's a thing. It's a fire. You can it's never make it right. And, um, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's fucking tough to deal with. And, and, uh, but I just wanted to hear, you know, from somebody that's been there. Well, we try to find, you try to find outlets, you know, like anybody, how to, how do you manage all of this stuff and you know guys work out and we find hobbies and all of that but over time as you know someone who's experienced this stuff it ultimately eats all of that away yeah i, t- I tell people ptsd will kill you and everything you fucking love yeah not instantly it's a slow death yeah but it'll it'll eventually consume you and everybody yeah. you everybody too yeah well you can't get rid of it nope but uh you can learn to live with it and uh and and still be an effective and, and, and contributing member of society. So how long, how long were you a firefighter the first go around? First time I was a firefighter, I was, it was three years, three years, Yep. three years. And you decided you wanted to change your pace. It kind of just happened. Um, I didn't really decide it. Uh, I had a great, great career going. I was having a lot of fun doing what I love to do. I, by this time I had switched fire departments. I went from the small town I grew up in to Charleston, South Carolina, which isn't a metropolitan area like New York or Chicago, but Charleston is a very old city and there was a lot of fires back then. So we were getting more action than, than you could have hoped for as a young fireman. I was living the life I wanted. And, uh, one day I was at the gym and a cop walks in and he starts bragging about being a police officer. And I was always a little curious anyway, because, you know, they say um, cops and firefighters all have one thing in common. They both want to be firemen, right? I've heard that. You heard that? And I uh, I was the opposite. I was always really curious about being a police officer too. But I couldn't do both because of the schedule. So somehow this guy talked me into doing a ride along with him. And are there people that do both? Yeah, there are. There are some that they, they're able to figure it out. Holy shit. Um, but there's not many of them. Um, it's usually one or the other. Because the schedules are so stringent and they, yeah. they, they overlap too much. So I, uh, at the gym I was working at part-time, um, this, this cop starts bragging about being a cop and how much fun they have. And he was in the city of North Charleston, which is obviously just north of us. And it was a, it was a very violent city back then. It was fifth most, most violent city in the nation per capita. And the things he would tell me, I was like, man, there's no way. He said, come do a ride along with me. And I did a ride along and it was over. I yeah. had it. That's it's no different than if the seals took you for a ride along <laughs> or they're like, Hey, or go, go sit on the ship in the galley. And you want to do that? You want to do this? Yeah. And it was another level of, um, of emergency services, just a side I never got to see, you know? And, uh, I had to do it. I had to, I've always been a guy. If something interests me, I have to try it. I cannot live with the fact that I didn't try something I wanted to do. You do just going back. You do realize 99.9% of the fucking population would rather sit on their ass in the galley and yes. fucking get fat. Eat, I, chill, I, I, eat I do. Chill. Know. Okay. I, I know right. that now. And I am with that 99% because of what I know about law enforcement. There's yeah. a reason why I'm like, yeah, I'd rather do that. All and right. I support the fuck out of cops. Yeah. There ain't no way in hell I'd ever do it again. Yeah. So All yeah, right. I gave it a go. Sorry to interrupt you, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so you you talk about uh, kind of your career as law enforcement, and um, you brought to light something else where um, you had you were on the ground, you were getting your face beat in, then you went to a domestic call, and then you went to uh, there was like a fucking dog disturbance yeah. or something which was nothing. And you were trying to, and you did a very good job, paint the picture of, 
I'm fighting for my life in the middle of the fucking street. Somebody's beating your face in, trying to kill you, to a domestic violence call, to a little old lady or whoever the hell it was that just was complaining about a dog. Yeah. And, you know, you, you had two, one, you just about lost your fucking life in the middle of the street. And, and, and how long was it until you have to listen to somebody bitch about a fucking noise complaint? Minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Before they call and complain to a supervisor. Wow. So, uh, that's 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 fucking impossible to uh, switch that off. It's physically fucking impossible. You imagine going from like two gunfights to having to go play patty cake with a motherfucker. The mindset you're in when, no. when it's time for patty cake. N- no, I can't. <laughs> that's what it's like. Yeah, this is like being a cop. You're literally in a fight for your life. I got a guy on top of me beating me senseless, trying to take my weapon. He had it halfway out. Had it not been for another police officer, I'd have died right there in that parking lot that night. And he told us he was going he was going to blow my brains out with my weapon. Yeah, because he was going back to prison. All because I found cocaine on him. I didn't know this man. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what he was capable of doing. He sucker punched me. Uh, my knees got weak when that happens. I mean, I'm human. And I fall down. And before I could get up, he's on top of me, ground and pound. And he's, he's striking me in the face. And I'm guarding my face. And next thing I know is I feel my whole left side, or excuse me, my right side, where I carry my weapon, being pulled up. And what I'm trying to do is block his blows with one hand so I can stay conscious, stay in the fight and keep him from ripping my weapon off of my body with the other hand. And, uh, in good fortune that night, um, my old training officer was literally right around the corner and he saved me and he beat the shit out of that guy, got him off of me. And we were able to, uh, get him under arrest. And within five, 10 minutes, I'm on a, I'm on another call, go into a disturbance call or a domestic dispute call. And then when you get there, Guys clearly beat a woman. He needs to go to jail. You start locking him up. Now you're fighting the fucking wife because now you're locking her husband up. She's the one that called. Now you're fighting her. You don't have the handcuffs on him. Now he's fighting you. And you're in the fight for your life again. Like you Now you don't want to go back to where you were. I don't want to be on my back. I'm fighting two people. I don't want anybody on top of me striking me. You finally get them both subdued because your backup arrives again in the nick of time. And... uh they go to jail, and then a few minutes later, you're at a barking dog call. There's no time for decompression. It's yeah. call to call to call. And uh, pardon me if my fucking tone is a little off when I'm talking to you about your barking dog. Yeah. But I almost just got killed twice. Yeah. And I'm not in the mood for this shit. Sorry I didn't put my kid gloves on. Yeah. And then before you know it, you're in a supervisor's office dancing on the carpet trying to explain your actions because your tone was inappropriate. Yeah. Why are you calling me for this fucking barking dog? You know what I mean? Yeah. And when they start talking about defund the police, initially I thought it was a bad thing. But you know what? Defund them and let other people come, civilians, take those barking dog calls. Because you don't need to be sending people that are damn near getting their faces beat in, sending them to that call. Yeah. That's insane. I'm with you on that. Um you know, it's it's just in today's society, it's it's just so fucking easy for people to to judge and tell you how to do your fucking job, and uh, you know, sit behind a fucking desk and 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 you know, cause a fucking scene when they've never they've never taken one step in those shoes. I like that saying, um, people sleep peacefully at night because men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Yeah. And it's, it's an awesome saying because there are people out there who are doing violence, who are in harm's way constantly. So people can live these comfortable, judgmental lives. Yeah. They've never even seen a bloody fucking nose and they're telling you how somebody should be doing something. Fuck off. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a fucking disgrace. But, um, Back to defunding the police. I, I was a hundred percent against it too, and and um, then I thought about it, and I actually had kind of a same the same opinion that you had. They shouldn't be responding to a fucking barking dog or a noise complaint, or you know, and and unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, there always has to be fucking compromise, and if. 
if half the population is fucking pissed, you know, about something and the other half isn't, I mean, I think there is definitely a way to fucking compromise and that would be the perfect thing because I don't think cops should be doing that anyways. And, oh, you want the fucking police to fund it? Here we go. You know, no more speeding tickets. You know, they have fucking cameras that can do that shit. We can put a fucking camera at a red light. And then, you know what, that alleviates probably, I don't know how much, but I'm going to say, what, maybe 75% of interactions between police and, uh, you know, the community's citizens. But then you put a camera at a red light and you put a fucking speed trap out and then everybody fucking bitches because it's, you know what I mean? Because, oh, that's a fucking hidden camera. That's illegal. You can't do that. And it's like, well, what the fuck do you want, you know? Here we are, we just, that's a defund, right? Now we don't have to have guys on the street writing fucking speeding tickets. I'd rather just speed everywhere and get my picture taken and mail the check in. But, you know, it's, it's, it's it, people are gonna fucking whine and moan no matter what, you know, is, is done, but. It's never enough. And this is that coddled ass society that we live in. We have too much. Yeah. And it's just never enough. And people just want to complain until they take it all from us and strip it from us. And then they'll want to go back to the way it used to be. Yeah. So. Well, hopefully it's not coming to that. But, I hope not. <laughs> but um, yeah. But so <clears throat> it's impossible to flip that switch and go from I was getting I was getting ready to be murdered in the middle of the fucking street to now. Can you please, uh, can you please, uh, you know, put your puppy away? Yeah, put your puppy away. You're disturbing the neighbor. Put that fucking yeah. dog. <laughs> but, uh, but you actually uh, ran into what year was it? This was 2003 to 2005, correct? Yes, correct. Police officer. Yeah. And um, and there were a lot of politics going on back then, and uh, you actually got fired. I did from the police department. Best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> I realize that now as an old, wiser man, yeah. not old, older. Um, yeah, I got, you know, I've never experienced a political machine before because the fire department wasn't like that. When I was on the job, I've heard stories now. It's a little bit more political. But um, when I was there, it was just so much fun to be there. But, man, when I transitioned from fire department where we just fucked off every single day, played pranks on each other, then you go to the police department and you're doing your job and you're getting in trouble for it and you get investigated for it, and you get cleared for it, and you still have to explain things, it, it, it's like no other world I can, I can explain. Only police officers will understand what the fuck I'm talking about right now, where you wake up every day and you're worried about, all right, am I getting fired today because of something I said yesterday, something I did yesterday, when I know I did the right thing? It's a matter of how you're portrayed. Um, we, we were very aggressive back then and not overly aggressive. Like we're, we weren't violating rights and all that shit. That's not what I'm talking about. We were proactive police officers. So we went out looking for the bad guy. And where I worked back then, there was a lot of bad guys running around. And the problem is when you interact with bad guys, they're not fucking nice to you. They're not polite to you. They try to kill you, case in point, the last conversation. Okay? You get in fights with men with guns. You know what that's like. A lot of people don't understand what that's like to have physically be in a fight with a man that has a gun. And if he gets to that gun, he's going to kill you with it, you know? So, yeah, sometimes you throw him down a little fucking harder than society would have liked you to. His head bounced off the fucking concrete. My bad. I can't yeah. apologize for that. The man was going to fucking shoot me. Um, I had to explain myself all the time, man. I get, um, I chase a guy down one, uh, one afternoon. He was in a stolen car. He had a stolen handgun. He had a lot of crack cocaine on him. We got into a fight in a parking lot. His handgun falls onto the, onto the concrete, and I had a decision to make. He was reaching for it. I could have shot him. I would have been justified all day, um, but I didn't. I holstered up and went went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the man and ended up getting police officer of the month for this, right? And the reason I tell you this is because just a couple of months later, same exact scenario happens, and I'm getting fucking reprimanded for it. Nothing changed. It's just optics, right, yeah. what it looked like. So... Uh, I ended up, what I got fired for was just something completely, it was just complete bullshit. I get pulled up into the, um, deputy chief's office with my captain and the deputy chief. 
And they asked if everything was okay, and I said yes. And they said, uh, well, you're getting into a lot of stuff out here. We just needed to check, and we want to bring the noise level down with you a little bit, so just answer your calls from here on out. And as 20, 25, 26-year-old police officer, them telling you to just answer your calls and not go be proactive, it's kind of a slap in the face. That had to be demoralizing. It'd be like they're taking you off of an operational unit and putting you behind a desk. That's about how it would feel. So I walk out of there with the mindset of like, yeah, whatever, fuck y'all. And then literally 20 minutes, I'm in I'm in a goddamn fight in an alley with a guy who just tried to bail out of a car on me. And uh, they another officer found drug evidence in a car. And before I knew it, I was getting fired for asking this officer supposedly to lie for me about where we found the drug evidence in the car. And that's another long story, but it never happened. And I was able to prove that eight years later and have that overturned. It's not like I was charged for anything, but I got fired because I was just making too much noise and I didn't listen to the higher ups when they told me, hey, slow down. So they did. They had they had reason to get rid of me. What what, what are the fucking repercussions of you uh, fighting real crime? Why is that a fucking bad thing for a police department? Is the And I hear this shit all the time. Is the brass at a police department just a bunch of fucking pussies or what is the fucking issue? Long and short, yeah. What happens is the brass comes up doing exactly the same things these junior officers did, and now they're in positions of power. Not saying they're abusing that power, but they're in positions now that where their jobs are secure, and they don't want to lose their pension or their career. So now they have to pretty much tell other officers when they know you're doing a great job to stop doing a fucking great job, and it sucks. Because the city, honestly, I know I talk about this in my book where I know teams that would – get into too much trouble. So what they would do is they'd just go sit at the Waffle House for 10 hours, their entire fucking shift, and they would only go take their calls. And in the meantime, there's crime going on everywhere. And these officers are not in these communities. They were like, fuck that. We're not losing our jobs. Y'all want us to be quiet? We'll be quiet. And that's the result. And you see it happening right now. All these crime waves that are going on in cities, cops are like, fuck it. We're not being proactive because we're going to lose our jobs. We're going to get murdered in the process anyway. Yeah. There's no point in it. Yeah. And that's the political side of the police department that I hated. It's we did a great job. What what it boils down to is your supervisors are doing so much paperwork on you and they have to do interdepartmentals. They have to justify everything you're doing on every call. And that gets old too. So I can't blame them in a sense. I mean, you'd have to document, 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 document. And it gets it gets tiresome and it gets old. So where does the fucking pressure come from though? Is it the mayor? Mayor. Are they trying to, like, scrub the crime stats? The mayor, the citizens, city council, that's where it all comes from, man. Everybody wants to keep their little position of power until, instead of looking at people and saying, you know what, shut the fuck up. These guys are doing a great job. Yeah. They're out here protecting your fucking ass. Yeah. And sorry if they're not doing it politely. Yeah. You spit in a cop's face and he grabs you by the fucking neck and throws you down. Well, good for you. You yeah. know, you should be fucking thrown down. You shouldn't be able to do that to the police. Yeah. You know what? That's We've gotten so far away from, I think it, it all goes back to the home. There's no fucking parenting going on in these homes, and there's no respect for authority. And all those kids have grown up now, and they just be, expect to be able to go piss right in authority's face. And then when the authority turns around and slaps them for it, it's a big fucking deal. Like, I don't understand that. Yeah, it's it's uh, there are uh, no more immediate consequences. No. There's still consequences. You know, we're seeing it right now in the fucking streets. Yeah. This, the consequences that are coming from that aren't, you know, it'll take a minute. And then the pendulum's going to swing back the other way. And it's a fucking accountability issue, too. And, and you know, I hear, uh, you know, like yourself, a lot of people are like, it's how these fucking kids were raised, these fucking millennials and blah, blah, blah. Well, who the fuck raised them? You know what I mean? Yeah. Is it... The one that's sitting there fucking bitching about him because that's your fucking, you know, you take accountability for that, you fucking piece of shit. And uh, and nobody takes accountability anymore. Everybody it's always it. passed on, you know, to the to the to the to the, you know, shit rolls downhill and uh, there's no more accountability and the fucking consequences aren't immediate. And uh, and it's created. We're all about to pay for that what we're looking at right now but um, can bitch about that all day too yeah but uh yeah it's pissing me off so much my getting fucking goosebumps on the back of my I neck i can see it but <laughs> see your trigger finger moving over there yeah like, calm down yeah yeah 
But, um, well, on that note, uh, let's take a quick commercial break. When we come back, um, we're going to talk about June 18th, 2007, um, you know, the Sofa Superstore incident that, uh, you know, was the second second most tragic event and biggest loss of uh, firefighters, uh, only second to 9-11. Structural firefighters, yeah. Yeah. Some wildland firefighters. It's a bigger number, but... Oh. Yeah. But um, we're going to visit that when we come back. Yep. Sometimes these episodes can be pretty long, and they will always keep you on the edge of your seat. Rather than sit here and watch it alone, why don't you head over to VigilanceElite.com, buy yourself some company, and get some Vigilance Elite gummy bears. Not bad. All right, man, we're back from the break and uh, getting ready to go into what happened on June 18th, 2007. So the uh, Sofa Superstore fire, which claimed the lives of nine firefighters and um, is one of the most tragic events in American firefighter history, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. You're right. And you were a part of that and you responded to that. And um, you mentioned that um, this changed your life forever. And <clears throat> it, out of all the traumatic events that uh, you've witnessed and been a part of, uh, this is kind of what, this is the straw that broke the camel's back and uh, kind of sent you into the downward spiral of PTSD. And then also, uh, I watched a, I did a lot of research on this too, and uh, it seemed to be a very uh, controversial incident and a lot of lessons learned happened from it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and it seems that the, the men, you know, like yourself that, that survived it are, are considered legends uh, in the community. But I wanted to, uh, before we get going on that, I kind of want to put everybody in the mindset of how how horrific this was. So I want to roll the tape. So I played that to get everybody in the mindset. I want them to know how fucking serious this is. And that was your best friend on the phone and uh, telling his wife that he loved her. And uh, like, um, I really just want to set the tone on how fucking serious and tragic this was. The day started for you at a memorial golf tournament. And I'd like to start from, from right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, his last words that you heard was my friend, my best friend, Louis Mulkey, and his last dying words as he was burning to death. Stuff to hear. June 18th, um, 2007 started out as a normal day for us. We, uh, we certainly weren't expecting any of that. We, uh, we actually all got together. I was off duty that day and um, we were having a golf tournament for another friend of ours who's a firefighter who was killed four months to the day prior in a car accident. And that was another really good friend of mine who got me, who got me the job in Charleston actually. Really? Yeah. He was one of, one of my other best friends. I mean, it's, it is uh, so paying homage to him trying to, raise some money for his family at a golf tournament and we're doing what, what firemen do. And just like, you know, what, uh, what seals do when y'all get together and cops do when they get together, we get, we get drunk and we have a good time. And that's, uh, that's what that golf tournament was about. But by the end of the day, you heard the tapes. That's what we were all 
thrown into. And uh, at the end of the golf tournament, we um, everybody's phones kind of started ringing, and uh, we were all told to stuff a superstore is on fire, and we all knew that that was a horrible place to have a fire. We re often referred to that as a, as a death trap if if that's one of the calls we ever had to go on because we, as firefighters, you pre-plan buildings. That means you find buildings in your area and it could possibly be a threat or um, get be very bad. So you had to like kind of strategically plan how, how you would face this monster in the event that would happen. How many buildings were like that in that city? Tons of them. Tons of them? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. It's just old, old furniture store. It's actually an old grocery store that was converted into a, uh, a one-story furniture warehouse. I mean, so it was a huge, it was like a hundred something thousand square feet. Don't quote me on the square footage, but it was a big showroom and then it had a big storage storage facility behind it. And that's where the fire started. So when we found out that that building was on fire. We, um, we all got in our cars and just went. Um, what were you thinking on the way there? I'd heard that my friend Lewis was missing. You heard that before you even arrived? Yeah. When you heard that it was the Sofa Superstore, did that did you know it was gonna be fucking bad since since the that was already pinging on everybody's radar? Well it's like I told you earlier, it doesn't uh never seems real until it's real. Yeah. And uh it just seemed like another fire. But when I heard he was missing that extra adrenaline kicked in and I drove faster. I broke through a police barricade with my vehicle. I mean, I didn't drive through it like smoking and Bandit or anything. We just went around it and the cop was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, fuck you. And I kept going. And when we got there, the building had just collapsed. So I got there right when everybody had been pulled out. And my girlfriend was driving my car at the time. My firehouse was right up the street. I told her, I said, go to my, my locker in my firehouse, grab my shit and get it back to me. I got to find out what's going on. And so this time you got hundreds of firemen on scene, man. I mean, hundreds. There's probably 300 something plus people on the scene that night. And it was just a sea of red lights everywhere. And I uh, ran up to my buddy, David Griffin, who was pumping. Uh, he was the engineer on engine 11. And I ran up to him and I said, David, what do we have? And he, he turned around. He said, Lewis is missing. And uh, he said, Travis, we got a lot more guys in there too. We don't know how many. And I was, yeah. I was like, in, in that I mean, because now the building is, is down and there's just fire every fucking where, everywhere you look, it's just fire blowing. And in, uh, in Charleston Fire Department, we didn't back out of fires. Um, we were very cowboyish and we were very prideful of the way that we did things. And we were very, very aggressive. And this is hundreds of years of tradition. Mm -hmm. And it finally caught us like, and, it, and bit us and it cost us nine guys. And, uh, I remember hearing reports of like 19 or 20 initially is what they thought. But by the time the smoke settled, it was nine. And it was nine really good dudes. And all of those dudes I knew very personally. I'd worked with every single one of them. We, uh, we sat around that table breaking bread many a nights, having jokes, having laughs. You knew their families. And uh, Lewis was... Uh, just happened to be my best friend because, and uh, he, I wasn't his best friend. He was one of those really cool dudes that had a lot of best friends, but he was my best friend. And uh, he, when I started with Charleston Fire, he took me under his wing and showed me the ropes. And uh, I had a very special connection with him. And I didn't know by the end of the night, I still didn't know what lie ahead. I didn't know that I'd be the one next to his burnt corpse sitting there looking at him in a manner I I can try to describe, but it's going to be hard. You did make entry. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, you, you, did you make entry and you got pulled back? Was that, was that right? Well, we went around the Delta side of the building. So when you're looking at a building, the front is alpha and then you go around clockwise. So we got to the Delta side, which is square building would be the right side. And we go through this place, man, it was, um, it was just twisted steel, it looked like spaghetti, spaghetti noodles, and it was still hot. There was still a lot of fire present, and uh, but we had guys missing. We didn't have time to not get in there. We really wanted to find these guys, and I guess some of us thought that we were going to find them alive, but it's just not the case. There was, I think, around 15 to 20 of us on the body recovery teams. We were all 
broken apart and put into five man teams. And we all came in from different parts of the building. Um, and, uh, my five man team, we went in and it was literally, you couldn't move two or three feet and you had to stop and you had to figure out a way to get through the voids that were there. Um, there'd be like a little hollow opening here and we'd crawl through that. And the next two seconds you're standing on what used to be the roof. So you're, you're in it at this point and how many guys are with you? Four other guys. And so just to paint a picture, cause you got really descriptive in your book about the smoke, you can't see your fucking hand in front of your face, the heat and, and there was nothing, uh, and I could see how it would be easy to get disoriented and, and fucking lost and something like that. And you couldn't even, uh, you couldn't even bring a hose in with you to retrace your steps to get the fuck out. And, um, I mean, the amount of courage that takes, I mean, it, it, and it doesn't, uh, did it seem like it was even a courageous thing? Did it probably didn't even go through your fucking head? No, it was just, thing, we're going. Only thing is, is they wanted volunteers and a lot of guys didn't raise their hand. No very, shit. Very, I think, cause those guys knew they didn't want what was on the, on the inside of that building. It's not yeah. that they're less of a firefighter. Yeah. I think that they just knew, I don't want to fuck with that. Yeah. And we're here to do whatever we got to do. But there was a select group of us that did. And uh, I certainly, you know, often say the worst decision I ever made was going inside of that building that night. But the best decision I've ever made in my life was going inside of that fucking building that night and carrying them, carrying them all home. Um, and uh, it didn't seem like anything courageous. It's just what needed to be done. You know, our guys are down. We got guys down. We got to do what we got to do. Let's push forward and go get it. So we didn't. We didn't even have fucking air packs on our back because they were all used. Yeah. So we're choking on smoke and we have what we call flash hoods. The firefighters have flash hoods. And when you put your face piece on, you pull your flash hood up and it protects the skin right here. It protects your neck and your ears. So we're choking on smoke, literally gagging on black smoke. Um, and you, you you can't see. There's You know, and you're crawling next to big flames, fires, and they have ladder companies dumping water on top of us. And in a normal fire situation, you would never be operating inside of a fire when you have tower units raining water down because they're just so powerful, it could hurt you. It could you, it could injure a firefighter, blow debris on them. It could push fire on top of them and kill them. But we had no choice. We had to go in. We had to do what needed to be done. And it seemed like it took a long time to get to to them. And once we started finding them, um, you would hear a team shout out, hey, I got somebody and, and, and we would do the same. And um, I saw something silver and um, it didn't look like anything we had seen up until this point because everything was just black. And then I, I saw something and I went over to investigate what it was and it was by myself. And I crawled up there on my hands and knees. And um, I started looking at this thing and I, t I say it in my book, I was just I was turning my head like a curious dog, trying to figure out what the fuck is this. And I realized that uh, it was an air pack of one of our one of our guys. And it was, uh, we wore silver, silver, silver Scott air packs. And it had busted open. It didn't look like an air pack. It was just like, it was like filleted open. And uh, once I realized what it was, I had my hands. I looked down and I realized my hands were on the shoulders of one of our guys. And we wore black gear. It just looked like a, a pile of black shit, like debris. And then when I realized that, I pushed, I pushed back, and I looked down and uh, I realized these were his shoulders. That's his back because the pack is on his back. So this, his head should be right here. But there was no head. There was nothing. It was uh, there was there was just a couple of teeth. There was no helmet. There was no skull. There was just teeth. Jesus. And um, I looked down at the opening. There was an opening, and there's a spinal column sticking out. And I just when it got real for me, and I realized because I'd been to calls where we had burned up kids on Christmas. I've seen burned kids. I've been to burnt people many times, but nothing had like that one. No. No. 
I realized right then, whoever's in here is dead. Whatever count that they have on the outside, every one of them is fucking dead. And I knew Lewis was in there. And uh, we just, we had no way to tell who was who. That's one thing when you got a dead body there that you can recognize. But when you know it's one of yours and you don't know who the fuck it is. So what we had to do is um, we were tasked with not moving the bodies and just trying to identify them the best way that we could uh, without doing too much. And what the coroner was going to do after all the smoke cleared was come in and GPS them and locate where their bodies were. So that's what we did. So this, this one individual, um, Captain Billy, was... Uh, a really good dude. He'd been in fire service 30 something years. He was off engine 19. And um, we ended up pulling his fire pants down and his wallet was in his pants. And we, he opened it up and we saw his, his driver's license with his credit cards, man. And it was just like, God damn it. It's one thing when you're working with dead people and you have no relationship, you don't know them because it's not real. Yeah. You go to these things and it sucks. It fucks with you from time to time. But it's not personal. It's personal. Yeah. There's no get back like we talked about. And you're just like, what the fuck do I do? So, but we got a job to do, man. And we can't sit around too long. So we, we got to find more of our brothers. And then we go, we, we, we go not too far away and stumble on another one. Cause at this point, smoke's starting to lift a little bit more. As the fire got knocked down and, um, we found Mark and, um, he was, uh, he was face down. I rolled him over. His hands were in front of his face, and it's almost like like he saw the flashover that happened in that building. It's not a backdraft. That's movie shit. I mean, those things happen, but flashovers happen all the time in fires, and that's when everything reaches its combustible limit at the same exact time, and everything just, the, all the superheated gases in the building go, and it's just a big ball of fire, and 99% of firemen that are caught in these things die because it's so quick and it's so violent. It's almost like he felt it or saw it and did like this and then turned and fell his hands were like this but i didn't know it was mark mark was off of my truck ladder five and i had a fucking great relationship with mark we worked together um many times and so we roll him and you gotta think your bodies are still hot man you can still feel when you're touching them like i'm not wearing gloves at this point and i had them i, I would take them off from time to time but every once in a while we'd roll a guy over and you'd have your gloves off and you could feel that heat in your hands from their gear, how hot it was. And they were fucking burnt so bad. And when I rolled Mark over, the best description I can give you is we have a plastic face piece right here mm -hmm. that covers our eyes. And right here is usually rubber and it's black. I don't know if you've ever seen an ultrasound of a, of a baby, 3D, that's what his face looked like. It was baked into his mask. Damn. And um, he undid his coat pull his coat open and, and we had metal name tags back then and it had his name right there. And that's how we identified Mark. And we heard other teams yelling out that they were finding guys and, you know, it sounds selfish and everything, but I was so worried about Lewis. You know, all of these guys were important to me, but this is, this is my dude. Yeah. It's your best friend. And I don't want it to be real. And I want to hurry up and find everybody. And I'm not wishing that it was somebody else, but you can't help. But in that moment to be like, please, don't be my friend. And uh, the next brother we found was Brandon, my team. We go into uh, this back storage room. It's like one of the only pieces of building that was really left intact. There was a lot of smoke damage, not a lot of fire damage. Um, and Brandon was huddled down in a corner and his body was just normal. We rolled him out of this corner and he just had a cut over his eye. And uh, what happened was Brandon ran out of air, but he got away from the fire, but he died from smoke. Damn. And he just looked peaceful, man. And uh, his um, his wedding invitations were in the mail. We're still being delivered everywhere around. And, and he died that night. He was actually just working for somebody else. He did a buddy shift for somebody else, and it cost him his life. Damn. So that Brandon was, I knew we had eight at that point. And, and by this time it had come through that we have nine confirmed because this is hours into the night. And, um, what's the, uh, what, 
was the fire completely out? Or was there still smoke? Can At this point, smoke was smoke was still there, but it was nothing like it was. I mean, it was we were in there for hours. Yeah. Um. So the the whole fucking building came down, and there was really nowhere for the smoke to go except into the atmosphere. Part of the showroom was still still there, but after mo- bulk of the fire was knocked down, because you got to think fire was in all these different little pockets where the collapses were. Yeah. And so once those were done, man, all the smoke pretty much dissipated. And that's why I think it took us so long to start finding guys is because there was so much smoke. I really think we probably crawled over them a couple times possibly. Shit. I just didn't know it. So uh, now I know we have eight. And some guys were in there with Brandon. And I love Brandon too, man. And just like a, I want to spend some time with him, do whatever we need to do, but i got to find Lewis, you know. Um, that limousine company you talked about that I owned, I, I drove for Lewis's wedding. We had a lot of fucking fun together, man. And uh, he, this is actually the night after his anniversary. He lived one one year and one one day after his anniversary. So I put my helmet on and I got a job to do, man. And um, I was actually in a part of the building where you could stand up and I start walking out. And man, I probably made it ten or fifteen feet, and I walked through what seemed to be a doorway. I'm having to relive this because it's. I can t- describe it to you. And, and when I did, as soon as I cleared that doorway, I looked to my left and he was laying right there. So, um, I, I knew it was him just by looking at his skull, you know? I didn't need confirmation. I knew. Because he had to, he had a distinct face and even when the, when a skin is baked off of somebody's face, you can still recognize them, and it's a sick thing to say. But I've 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 witnessed that. And Lewis was on his back, man, and his um his left leg was underneath his right. His right leg was straight out, and there was a piece of big ass piece of steel across it. And we ended up having to dig that out, but his arms were sticking up in the air, and his fucking sleeves were burnt off. His fire coat, all the skin was burnt off of him, and just his arm bones were sticking up. Uh, his radius and ulna, his hands were burnt off, and uh, his head was, his head was back, and his eyeballs were burnt out, and the fucking skin was burnt off of his face, and his mouth was wide open. And uh, I just got on my knees next to him, and told him how much I loved him. And the shitty thing about that is. Just four years prior to that, before I went to the police department, Lewis and I were on a call with Engine 6, and we went to a call where a man was murdered and burned to death, and um, he was set on fire with gasoline. And Lewis was on his knees on one side of the man, his name was Rodney, this guy, and I was on my knees next to the, next to him or across from Lewis, but next to Rodney. And I remember us locking eyes during this call. And just, we both had this, what the fuck moment we were thinking about. Like, what the fuck is going on? Why why does somebody do this to this human being? And just four years later, I'd be on my knees next to Lewis, burnt, even worse condition than that man was. And um, when we rolled that man over that night, his fucking arm snapped off because it was burnt so bad. And so that night when we're putting Lewis into his body bag and all of our other guys, I, I wanted to be very careful because I didn't want to hurt my friend. You're fucking dead and I didn't want to hurt him. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we get them all bagged up and then we, um, we get the American flags, we drape them. And then my team's tasked with carrying every single one of them out. And so that's what we did. We carried them out one by one. Sorry, man. This is real. This is, this is real. Yeah. This is the fucking job. Yeah. I signed how up for long? it. Sorry. I signed up for it. Didn't realize how real it would get. Yeah. 
How long was the chain of events up until this point? We're talking all day and all night. So, uh, my shift started at eight o'clock the next morning and I started from inside of that building. Yeah. I got there around seven thirty, eight o'clock that night. Pulled a full 12 hours inside of that building. We didn't come out. We stayed in there. As soon as we were able to get in, we got in and we stayed in there all night searching and digging and cutting steel and moving heaven and earth to get these guys out. And then um, when we got them out, hey, got a job to do. Your shift is up and we need y'all back in the firehouse. Yeah. And then uh, you got the ATF and all these other FBI, everybody's coming in and investigate this thing. We need y'all on the rigs. Y'all got to go to work. And that's the problem. Like you said, in combat, when you leave combat, you leave it over there. Yeah. We got to go and serve this same community that we just dropped nine of our own in. So we go to the firehouse, we back the rig in, and now we're there. And uh, we lost three guys out of my house. And their fucking cell phones wouldn't stop ringing. Because everybody's trying to figure out. It's now made national news that nine guys are dead, but nobody knows except us who they are. Yeah. And you hear these guys' phones ringing, man. And and, and we, had, we had to go back there and shut them all off. And you know it's their family just freaking the fuck out. We couldn't take it. And then you got fucking reporters showing up. Like leeches within fucking minutes. Trying to st shove a microphone in somebody's face to find out, hey, how do you feel? How the fuck you think I feel? Yeah. You know, I'm not trying to glorify this shit. This fucking sucks. Yeah. But we got a job to do because there's other fires to go to. There's wrecks. People are fucking killing themselves. Goddamn babies are drowning in pools. And we just got to stack this on top of the other bullshit and fucking keep going. Yeah. Did they offer, um, I mean, I know this is early on, but I mean, was there any, did they offer any help at all? The department? Man, I can't. So our department did the best they could with what we had at the time. We'd never, in the fire service, there had been other incidents, but... Not like this magnitude, I guess. Yeah. And so it was kind of like a free fall to trying to figure out the best way to help guys. And they they came up with uh, with some counselors really quickly. I don't know the timeline on it. But they wanted guys, hey, man, we got these counselors for y'all. Go talk to. And, of course, me being alpha male like I am, I'm like, fuck them. I was like, these motherfuckers, they've never looked at their friends like we have. They've never fucking held dead babies in their fucking arms. They've read books. Who the fuck are they? To tell us how to feel and how to be. Yeah. And that was the problem. Because looking back, that was the worst fucking thing I could have ever done. I hurt myself with that mentality and I hurt other guys around me because I would tell them to, if you go talk to anybody, you're a fucking pussy. And that's one of the biggest regrets I have because I talk about being a coward. And it's not easy to say that. That's me being a coward. That's me being too manly, too macho, and having too much of a fucking ego to accept the help that is available to us. We had people, licensed professionals, who would listen to us. Maybe had I listened to them, I wouldn't have fucking shoved a gun down my throat and pulled the fucking trigger. Maybe if I listened to them, I wouldn't have burned my entire fucking inner circle down to the ground, you know? But I wouldn't even give it a chance because I was too macho of the culture that I had been exposed to my entire life. And that's what I speak on now. I speak about how we're killing each other with this suck it up mentality because it's bullshit. Yeah. I understand it. Suck it up. We have to deal with certain things. But there's nothing wrong with, hey, suck it up while we're doing this. We got a job to do. Let's go get our guys. And then when we come back, if it if it fucking bothers you, let's talk about it. Because there's nothing wrong with me and you being completely human and not being okay. It's okay to not be okay. And that's what I'm trying to instill in, in when I speak at conferences and everything. It's okay doesn't make you less of a man. Fuck, it makes you more of a man. Yeah. You know, that's it's unfortunate because uh, that mentality is fucking through, you know. It's, uh, as far as I know, it's in just about every uh, community that that, that uh, continuously deals with these type of events or, or uh, you know, traumatic stuff. And, and But it is, you know, it's starting to change from, you know, guys like yourself coming out and saying like, hey, this shit isn't right, what we've been doing for the last, you know, however many fucking years, forever, 
and uh, it, it is starting to change, I think, and 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 uh, across all the services and 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 military too. Yeah. But um, you know, you're spearheading it in your community, and uh, that takes a lot of fucking courage. This sucks, man, because this is what it does to you, and you have to relive it, and it's hard. And when these cameras shut off, and when I go get in my fucking car today and I take that hour long drive to the airport. I'm alone and I've just relived this thing and it is fucking brutal. But yeah. you know what? It's worth me doing that if it reaches one fucking person in our community or even outside and it helps them become a better mother, father, husband, wife, child, whatever. If it helps them realize that they need help and they can go get the help they want, then fuck it. I'll relive it. Because that's what we do. Yeah. We lift people up. We don't fucking help bring them down. And I got caught in this vicious cycle of bringing people down because I was so fucked up for so long. When my whole world crumbled down on top of me right after that, when everything just started, I mean, everything just started eating shit around me. I fell into the victim mindset. And it was the whole, why me? Why me? Why me? Why have I been exposed to all this? Why have I experienced this? I got scared to go to fucking sleep at night. I was, I would cry alone away from my wife I would be in another room crying because I was afraid to go to fucking sleep because of what was coming for me in the middle of the night I knew it yeah and I would hide that and I'm not ashamed of that anymore we'll get into um we're gonna get into you know some uh the after effects and how it affected your life and your family life and all your 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 team and and everything change your 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 entire fucking life uh forever we'll get into that in a minute but um a lot of controversy happened after that fire um and i'm not i could not find why can you just what if you were in charge would something have happened would you have done anything different no no i back our chief man and it's it's the way we were taught. And here's the problem. Was it the culture? It was the culture. It wasn't the chief. He took good care of his department. We had a cowboy culture, and back then it was okay, and it was accepted, and it was expected, right? Everybody Monday morning in the fire service, people Monday morning quarterback this fucking fire like you wouldn't believe. I never read the NIOSH reports. I don't care. You know why? Because I was fucking there. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what happened. We lost nine guys. We learn from that. I mean, I guess it, it does matter what happened because it's implemented change throughout the entire fire service. Um, but we were only doing what we were taught to do, and which is go get it, be aggressive. Now, those guys went in there. There was somebody was trapped inside of that building, and it wasn't necessarily those nine guys that saved them. It was another crew. But they went in there. They knew somebody was in there and needed to come out. They were in there after the fire. Shit just broke bad in an instant, and there was no fucking escaping it. You just couldn't get away from it. Um, had I been in charge since, since you ask back then with the culture that we were in and the mentality and the training and how we did things, I don't see that I would have done anything differently. It was just an entire set of circumstances that led to that. Yeah. Um, a lot of folks were like, well, y'all, y'all didn't use enough water. You didn't have big enough hose lines. We had every fucking hose on every truck in that building even the little hoses that we call booster hoses. And there are people were saying we didn't have big enough supply lines. Well, that may have been true, but that's all changed since then. We went from two and a half inch supply lines to five inch supply lines. And that may be speaking over your head because you, if you don't understand firefighting terms, but that means getting more water to the engines that are pumping the fires, which in turn can get more water so there's no lack of water supply. Um, not trying to get scientific. But those things have changed. But you know as well as I do, Sean, Shitty things have to happen yeah. for better things to happen. And that's just something we have to accept. Things in the military happen. Shitty things. Shitty things in law enforcement happen. That's the only way things change. Yeah. It's it's kind of a necessary evil. I hate to say that. Yeah. The only thing that you would go back if you could and change would be the culture. And... uh I mean, I understand that, but that's fucking impossible to change. And that, and our culture was very similar, you know. I mean, 
as much as I hate to say it, that's what you fucking sign up to do. Yeah. And just like we talked about earlier, you know, that is, uh, that's, that's what you want to fucking do. You want to be in that, you know, and, and, um, and, uh, you, you feel fucking invincible. I mean, how many fucking fires had you gone to prior to Tons. that, you know, and you, you get that sense of invincibility and, uh, and, and you fucking crave it. Um, and you especially, I mean, the culture started for you at, uh, what, 15 fucking years 15, old. Yeah. You know, you grew up in a firehouse. You left it for, what, four years? Four years. Came right back. Left it for three, two, two, two years, years. Came right back. And so that's just fucking who you are. You know, it's it's no different than, you know, people being raised by, you know, but it's how you were fucking raised. You that's grew it. up in it. You know, and of course, if I could change it, I would. If I could go back and say, hey, this is coming, and what can we do to prevent this, I would. But what I what I know now mm-hmm. is I cannot live in the past and, and do the whys. Why did this happen? Well, you know what? It fucking happened. It's called ownership and acceptance. Yeah. Own the fact that it happened, accept it, and press the fuck forward and do the best that you can with the life and the time that you have left. And that is what changed my life. It was that perspective, but it took a long time to fucking get there. Yeah. Well, where I'm going with this is, um, you know, uh, guilt. And you wouldn't have changed anything. And I'm willing to bet that um, your best friend, Lewis, wouldn't have fucking changed anything either. And they died doing what they wanted to do. And, uh, and, uh, you know, we were going to do a video on, uh, accepting loss and kind of moving past it. And, well, you know, in professions like this, a lot of times, you know, that's, um, I'm not going to say that's how you want to go out, but the guys I know, I don't think they would have fucking gone out any other way. You don't want to go out 90 years old, somebody wiping your fucking ass and feeding you pudding. Nope. That's, I get it. So yeah, yeah, I'm the same way. And they're the same way. It's, it's shitty if it happens, but go out like a fucking warrior. Yep. Doing what you were put here to fucking do. Yeah. But, um, that's why I was bringing that up. Um, how long did it take you to, uh, be able to, to talk about that long time many years to talk about it the way that i talk about it now yeah i lo- long time fucking decade i've i tried i tried later on in life to talk about it and i shut down every time I just couldn't do it yeah but i realized at some point that my experiences may help other people too and by me speaking about it it may help me as well and that it did and that's why I do now. Yeah. Um, you're changing the culture, man. You are changing the fucking culture. And uh, you're the only one I know that's actually doing it. That's actually out putting yourself out there. And I'll bet you get a lot of fucking hate. I do. And I'll bet you also get a lot of praise. But um, moving forward just a little bit, you know, when it comes to the culture... On page 227 in your book, uh, excuse me, I don't want to butcher his name, but Captain John McGinnigal of Ladder 5 told me in the parking lot the very day that he retired and left the job after nearly 40 years, Captain John retired before June 18th, 2007, Sofa Superstore that claimed the lives of nine of our bravest. And this guy fucking had it right, you know, and uh, his parting words to me before getting into his car and leaving after his final shift were, in quotes, Travis, be careful. We're going to lose a lot of men the way we fight fire one day. We're not going to lose just one. We're going to lose multiple companies, end quote. And you say that... uh, those words still resonate with you to this day. I think about it all the time. Was he talking about 
the culture. He was t- yep, he was talking about the way we fight fire because there's one story that he told me. So Captain John versus telling me, hey, it was a nice couple years working with you, Travis. I had a lot of fun with you. That was his parting words. It was, be careful. We're going to kill a bunch of men the way that we do things. He knew it. Yeah. And he told me a story one time about an abandoned house that they were in. And he goes, he made fun of it. He's like, I don't know how the fucking house didn't fall over. And then he stepped and he goes, I know how I know how I didn't fucking ha- fall over. There were a goddamn hundred of us in there whole fucking holding it up. And that's how come it didn't fall over. But what he was getting at, there was no need to be inside of this thing. No. And it was burning asshole to elbows and end to end, top to bottom. And every guy was in there. And that's what it was like. You got to go get some. Yeah. I talk about being on fires where we have five houses burning at one time back in the day. And everybody's in them. Like, and there's fire everywhere. And you didn't want to be the man outside. And that's a saying, an old saying in the Charleston Fire Department. Don't get caught outside. Yeah. That's the culture. Because you were you were considered a pussy or somebody trying to get out of the harm's way. And as a young man, 25, 26 years old, you don't want to be that guy. You want to show everybody, I got what it takes to be here. Yeah. That's the culture. Is that culture starting to change now? I think slowly. Yeah. It's still there, though. When did you see it start to turn a little bit? It was years after this fire took place with us, and we had multiple regime changes uh, come in. Many of our older guys were either retired or they were pushed out by the new regimes that were coming in because they understood they did not favor the culture of our fire department. We were straight fucking cowboys. There is no way to put that, other way to put it. And they knew the way that we did things were wrong. It was dangerous, extremely dangerous. Couldn't tell us that. Yeah. And it was button heads because when we new chiefs were coming in, we butted heads with them because we still wanted to do it the old school way, even though we just got bit in the ass because that's the way we were trained. It's like you have a pit bull who's trained to fucking fight, and then you want to take him to the goddamn dog park and get mad at him when he bites a head off a fucking other dog. Yeah. You know, that's who we were at the time. Yeah. Not saying it was right, but that's who we were. And now it's a much different fire department these days. It says. It's still a great fire department, and it's probably better. I mean, they're more um, productive on scenes. I mean, they, they have their shit wired tight now, and it's done the right way. So... It's just, I was just part of it at a different time. Yeah. In 2008, um, John Carr sounds like he took over the mm-hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. What was the morale like when he came in? Not good because we didn't welcome outsiders. Yeah. And it was, uh, he wasn't received well at first, but he was a great man and he's a great chief. And he was actually, after he got there, he tried the best that he could, but he went downhill. He got pretty sick very quickly. He wasn't there that long um but we all started slowly to accept him because he was there to implement change we knew that uh, and it wasn't like hey i'm going to come in and punish you guys for being who you are although it felt like that in a sense at first because we just were not um used to a different command structure command staff yeah you know so it was we had to learn how to adapt to it yeah well, I mean, in a sense, he's fucking with tradition. That's exactly what it was. And so where we would, on a on a normal response, you got one engine, one ladder truck, or two engines, one ladder truck, and a, and a battalion chief on a fire. That could be three houses fucking burning. Back then, the culture was, hey, y'all better be able to handle it and not make me have to call another fucking company to come down here. Shit. And you're undermanned, understaffed, and if it starts getting away from you, it was looked down upon if... The fucking winds could control the fire. You know what I mean? Yeah. You get an ass ripping, piss ripping fire like that, and uh, the battalion chief has to call somebody else. The higher ups didn't like that. They're like, oh, you boys couldn't put that fucking fire out? And then people would slowly start getting transferred. Yeah. That happens too many times. So you had to be aggressive, man, if you want yeah. to keep your spot. So when Carr came in, he changed all of that. So then he, I remember he changed it to your, I, can't, I think it's like you're getting. Maybe four ladders, or no, four engine companies, two ladder companies, a battalion chief. And now all of a sudden at these fires, we had more than enough help. And it's like, damn, this is kind of fucking easy now. We didn't like the change at first, but then slowly started kind of taking on. It's like, hey, man, this is kind of reducing our workload a little bit. This is kind of nice. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's good. How long, uh, 
How long was he in there before uh, he started implementing these changes? Was it like fucking immediately? No, I, not that I remember. I think it was it was a slow, slow progression. Um, but we had so much turmoil going on with all the old guys, like all of our old captains, like the John McGinnigals. And when this this uh, when Chief Carr came in, everybody's like, "Fuck this! I'm leaving the department!" And all this all this fear got uh, injected into our department on what they were going to do, what they weren't going to do. So there was so much turmoil going on within the rank and file. You know, he didn't even really have to do much. We were all killing ourselves slowly inside. Damn. Um, but you know, he came in and I. I uh, you know, so long ago, I know he started changing SOP slowly but surely. He he changed the the what we would call the initial response. Uh, he changed that up immediately. Like, hey, you guys are undermanned, too, way too undermanned for these calls. We need to step it up and start sending you some more units. And he would do stuff like that. Um, they started doing training on the LDH hose, which is large diameter hose. And I remember that pissing off a lot of the old school guys because it's five inch hose that we would have to take out. And put on our trucks uh, for bigger water supply. Um, we didn't like that. It was honestly it was the smartest fucking thing you could possibly do, but we didn't like it because it's changed. Nobody likes change. Yeah. Um, but I was only there for two and a half years after that fire, so I didn't. Unfortunately, I didn't experience too much change. Um, the guys now are the ones that, that experienced all the change. The ones that are left. Are there still guys in? Very, very few. Very few. We lost. I want to say roughly a hundred men within the first year or two. Fuck. A huge turnover after that. I mean, and you're talking uh, 20, 30 year guys on the jobs just saying, fuck it, I'm leaving. Damn. I mean, uh, well, I mean, we're talking about courage. That takes, that takes a lot of courage too. Uh, car coming in there knowing, I mean, cause I'm, I mean, that culture is, uh, I mean, that culture is probably, I'm guessing is in in somewhat in every department across the U.S. For sure, hundred percent. So he's coming in knowing I'm I'm about to piss every motherfucker off out here. They're all gonna hate me, but I gotta do it. And then when you're coming into a hundred plus year old fire department, yeah, who's rich in tradition, and try to stir that up, that just doesn't go well. This wasn't a young fire department. I mean, this is a very very old fire department. Yeah. So yeah, it was tough. Well, I'm glad we talked about that, and and uh, I think it definitely paints a picture of how fucking real uh, things can get uh, when it comes to being a firefighter. And uh, on that note, let's take another break, and 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 we'll come back and go down the downward spiral. All right, sounds good. All right, man. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. I think this is a pretty good one. Hit pause, go over to vigilanceelite.com, pick yourself up one of these sweet shirts. And if you're lucky, maybe these hats will be in stock too. All right, we're back from the break again. And uh, the last section was, uh, pretty tough I know and um, and so now we're kind of going towards the downward spiral what you call the downward spiral in your book and uh, I've read a part you're in a fire and uh, you've got a guy a new guy with you that you refer to as a uh, sweet onion yeah and uh, for me it kind of sounded like this is where it started slipping uh, the most and um, and you're your actual, I wouldn't say your performance, but you got a little more ballsy than maybe you used to be, it sounded like in that section. Um, and you even referred to uh, the fact that you're running out of air, you kind of left the team, you're off on your own, didn't, you know what I mean? And uh, and then you actually had the thoughts going through your head of, of maybe you'll die in the fire like, like your best friend Lewis did. Yeah. And found a window, opened the window and got some fucking air. And uh and then and uh Sweet Onion sounded like he was kicking ass at that point. Yeah. 
and uh, you got recalled three, I guess, three horns is the is the signal. Yeah, it's, it's called evacuation. Out. So they'll they'll hit three horns to to make everybody back out of the building. And like I said, back in Charleston, we didn't do that. So it was this was new territory for us for backing out. Yeah. Well, there was another guy on scene there uh, who you refer to in your book as Captain Silva. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Silver. I changed his name to protect his identity, though. Yeah. Well, uh, we got him on the line here. So, huh? We got him on the line here. So, uh, Captain hey, Silva. What? How's it going, Captain Silva? I'm sitting here with uh, Travis House, and uh, what? he was talking about a uh, call or a uh, fire that you guys were in. And uh, in his book, and there was a new guy with him, and uh, you guys got recalled out of the building. And I just kind of wanted to uh, see if you guys could go over that actions on objective. Sure, sure. Actually, yeah, well, I was actually at the fire. I was. On, I came back on the next day. So specifically, me and Travis being in the building at the same time. Mm -hmm. that, no, that that didn't that didn't occur. That was somebody else. But um, no, he's Travis got the wrong phone. Hot part of that thing, um, the whole time. Is Travis online with you now? He's right here. That's Chief. Trav, what's up? Chief Ricky. Travis, I got the something for you, bro. It's waiting on you. You got what? I got something for you. You know what to do is. Ah, uh, yeah, and big old balls of yours. He's got the biggest balls in six counties. <laughs> call him, we call him Ricky. Ricky all balls, no shaft. How the fuck did y'all get his number? Hey, Chief. No, I was talking about that fire on Daniel Island where the townhouses were ripping, and they they backed us oh, out of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The one in the yard where I was raising hell because he pulled us out. Yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay, cool. Yeah, Sean, I, I had two fires mixed up, so we're on the same page now. All right. Right on. I'm glad uh, Travis could clarify. For He's us. like, I didn't go to that one. I'm like, the fuck you weren't. I so, changed his name and I changed your name in the book to protect your identity, but the lid's blown off now. Oh well, shit happens. Holy shit! Don't well, worry, Sean. I can't read. <laughs> that guy's money. Neither can I. But uh, yeah, so we don't have to worry about that. Well, I just wanted to kind of go over. We know where Travis was and what he was doing uh, during that fire. Uh, when the uh, when the siren rang out for the recall to get out, and we were wondering where, what were you doing at that time? Oh, on that particular fire right there, I, I had that thing by by the nozzle, so to speak. Me and a guy named Handy Andy went in there, and we put it down real well. And then we um, there was some extension. And uh, Sean, if I get the stuff you don't understand, just just pull me in, and I'll, I'll reel in a little bit. But there was some extension. And me and the other guys went in there for an extension. And also, um, Travis, where were you? Were you in the truck house then? I can't remember. No, nah, I was like, I was, uh, I was driving engine 16 that day, and we got called over for that thing. Yeah, we. If you remember, I, I robbed that thing from uh, um, Bubbles. Yeah, I do. Remember Bubbles? Yeah. Yeah, I took that fire from Bubbles. To be honest with you, and me and I, Handy Andy was my fireman at the time, and me and Handy we went in and we we, we knocked it down. I mean, we we beat it up pretty good. But there was some extension, and I know that as they were getting into the extension, they, they pulled us out, Sean, and naturally I wasn't real happy about that at all. <laughs> it doesn't sound like anybody was very happy about that call. Nah, nah, we, was, uh, um, we were uh, um, making good progress and all that. And that, that's, that was, um, Travis, that was before the main fire, wasn't it? No, nah, it was after, because remember, they, they blew those air horns to back us out. And we're all old now, but they blew those air horns back us out, and we weren't used to evacuating. Remember that? Yeah, that's right. That's Chief, right. We, we, Chief Larry. we had a lot of changes in SOP, Sean. Yeah. And then during that time, that was uh, that was the acclimation time for us. So um, as we was going through that transformation, you know, we couldn't be quite as aggressive as we were back in in our, our old days, our heyday, so to speak. So um, you're right. Um, when, when the horns came off and we had to come out, there was a bunch of unhappy firemen. Uh, we were sitting in the backyard, Travis, if I remember. remember. David Ishmael came back there, and I think I started on poor old Ish. Yeah, you were letting everybody have it. I remember because I was one of the last guys out of the building, and uh, you, you were on engine six, and you – 
fucking let me have it. And I was like, the fuck are you yelling? You're like, God damn it, we had it. We had it by the balls, Trav. What the fuck? We don't do this shit. We don't do this shit. And I just remember you coming unglued. And I was like, calm down, old man. Shit. <laughs> I love you, man. When's the last time you guys uh, connected? I saw him at a swingers party about... Um, <laughs> that fucker's wild right here. Yeah, yeah, Sean, there was two people there, me and Travis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and well, I was doing next time, let me know. The back you, of your balls were bruised, not Next time not to mine. do that, let me know if you need a third. I'll send somebody over. <laughs> I told Katie when she she locked this up, I said, do not get me and Travis together. You don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> but they went on with it anyway. Well, wow. Well, when is the last time you guys connected? That's been a few months. Yeah. No, I'm just yeah. taking it think, all in. I don't think he believed me, uh, that you were on the phone here, but. I didn't. I thought this was a, some prank. And then I heard his voice. I was like, oh, God damn. <laughs> Well, that guy's a legend, man. He's a legend in the fire service. Charles. That's awesome. He's a fucking man. Well, Chief, uh, Chief Ricky. Silva. Ricky. Well, his code Ricky. name was Silva in the book. Okay. Well, hey, I appreciate your time, and I, I really appreciate uh, you letting us give you a call. I just wanted to reconnect you guys here and and uh, and uh, relive the good old days. But but uh i think we'll wrap it up for now you guys got anything you want to say hey chief ricky i'll call you later all right baby all right stay light Travis. good talk to you sean good talking to you too man you too it was a pleasure be safe i love you chief all right guys later bye-bye wow you guys goddamn! I, I heard that guy's it. voice. I thought you were pranking. I was like, what the fuck's he doing? You thought I was fucking around? This, uh, yeah. I literally thought I had the wrong guy there for a minute. You're like, well, that's not him. I was like, oh, shit. Well, because you were saying the wrong name because it's a code name in the book. And I was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And then I heard his voice. I was like, my fucking face hurts, man. Yeah. I needed that after that last session. Holy shit. You might want to check your pants. <sighs> yeah, that guy's gold, man. He's a great he's a great human being. He was a fantastic fireman. He was on the job 30, 30 something years. And uh, that fire I was talking about was when he was a captain, but he later promoted to battalion chief. Uh, and he was a battalion chief downtown. And he was just fucking good as gold, man. God damn. Well, that's cool, man. Thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. I felt like I was back in the firehouse for a second. Yeah. Good feeling, isn't it? It's amazing. Right on, man. It's that chemistry you have with certain people, you know? That's the brotherhood. That's it. That's it right there. You know, that's that's uh there it is. <clears throat> but um I gotta figure out I gotta find out how y'all made that happen after the show. You want his number? I'll give it to you. I got his number. <laughs> I'm just fucking with it. This is fucking crazy. But uh yeah, I told you we do our research. But um so moving out, you um you got in a fight. Things started fucking Things started getting weird for you. Started going down the downward spiral. We know your mindset now in that fire. You know we're kind of where you were at mentally, which uh, is not a good spot to be in. And then, um, what eventually ended your career in the fire service? Um, so it was a culmination of a lot of things building up to one one major incident. So you say. I got in a fight. What I ended up going hands on with a lot of guys in the department over over the course of two and a half years, and it's not something I'm proud of. I'm actually very uh, embarrassed about it, but it happened, and it needs to be talked about because the reason I talk about it is you can see a shift in people's behavior. Like we're family, and when you see somebody acting differently, something is wrong. And nobody ever pulled me to the side to help me. Nobody ever pulled me to a side this to the side to try to figure out what was going on. What happened was this new behavior that I was taking on was just becoming normal. Um, at, the, at the funeral for one of our guys, I, uh, I got into a physical altercation on the bus. We had, a, we had a bunch of buses brought in because the funerals were so big, we couldn't take everybody's cars. So they had to bring families on buses and firemen mixed with families. And I was on a bus with some firemen and some families, some young children, some old people. And um, 
something was said to another fireman and, and he threw his hat at me and uh, kind of joking around, but kind of not. And I just stood up and slapped him and slapped him into the seat, the empty seat. And uh, everybody witnessed it. Yeah. And this is somebody I'm supposedly love, you know, and protect. And I just did that. And that event, everybody got up, they they left the bus, and I was kind of alone on, on the bus after that. And then uh, after that was more of the same. I, I got into physical altercations at the training facility where I assaulted one of our, our guys that needed help. He fell down, and he was having flashbacks of the fire. He was there that night, too, and he was screaming all of our dead guys' names. And I picked him up and started slamming him into the wall with all of his gear, and I was like, knock it the fuck off. And... When I did, one of the training uh, instructors came over and grabbed me and turned me around. And when he did, I threw him into the wall and told him, you know, you put your fucking hands on me, I'll kill you. And then uh, we had an academy instructor standing right there and I looked at him and I threatened to throw him out of a window. And that was accepted. And it was swept under the rug. And then again, behind a grocery store training one day, I slapped one of our other guys right in the face because he, he just came close to me and said something. And I just lashed out and hit him. And at this time, I was drinking a lot, though. You know, I was I was drinking. I was coming to work drunk and everything. It wasn't acceptable. It's it's embarrassing, man. But nobody, it wasn't just not an issue to anybody else. And it was just kind of all this was on my plate for me to deal with and to figure it out. And this is what happens to these cops and these firemen out there. They end up losing their jobs or hurting somebody else because of all the shit that they're going through. And yeah. they bring it to work. And that's what I was doing. I had no outlet for it. Um, the straw that broke the camel's back for me was... Um, I came to work one day, my 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 house engine 10 lighter five, and uh we had a new guy in our in our house and he he put his coffee cup on uh on our dead guy's monument. And it pissed me off. I went over there and I grabbed it and I shattered it on the ground and I opened the door and told him if he wants his cup, it's in a million pieces, and if he does it again, I'll fucking kill him. And those are the words that I use, and that's how I truly felt. Yeah. And when I said that, one of my other good friends said, Why are you being such an asshole? And when he did, I took that as him defending the new guy's actions and not defending our guy's honor. Yeah. And I told him if he says another word to me, I'll kill him too in a minute. And he said something to me. And um, at that time, a, a bomb was lit inside of me and the fuse was about that fucking short. And when he said what he said, it's like somebody poured gasoline on that fuse and, it, and then the bomb ignited. And I, to this day, I can't tell you what happened. Man. Because I completely lost it and I blacked out. And I just remember being outside with my captain shaking me. And I'm, I'm crying. And he just pretty much told me that I'd assaulted my entire firehouse. And the cops were called and they were on the way to arrest me. Damn. And my battalion chief showed up. And uh, at, this, at this time I was getting mental health counseling. But it wasn't, it wasn't enough and I didn't do it in time. How often? <sighs> Back then, I, I was just starting, man. So once once a week, maybe once every two weeks. But I would go there and I wouldn't say shit. You were skeptical. You didn't right. you hadn't built the trust yet. I, the trust wasn't there. I would just sit there and just kind of look and not really open up. But my battalion chief and my captain knew. Nobody else knew. I was still putting down people that was getting help. I was mm. too ashamed to let anybody know I was doing it. Um, I was. I had this tough guy image that I had to put out there. I had a. I had to be a, a big, strong, tough guy. I couldn't show any kind of vulnerability. So my chief shows up before the cops and he told me, he says, get to your counselor. They're coming here to lock you up. And that was my last day on the job. Damn. You were just uh, portraying uh, who you thought everybody thought you needed to be. Yeah, you're exactly yeah. right. I was like a closet, closet homosexual in the NFL. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Seriously, you hear about it all the time. And they have to be big, strong, tough guys, and they just have this image pretending to be something they're not. And they can't come out and, and, and tell people who they really are. And that's what I was, man. I was hurt. I was injured, and I needed fucking help. But I was too afraid to say it out of judgment Yeah, because I was surrounded by those kind of men just like me. Yeah, My captain was on the body recovery team with me. To this day, 13 years later, we haven't spoken a word about it. Nothing. Not one fucking word. Yeah. I mean, it, it just goes to show you how fucking um, toxic uh, that culture that culture can be. It's the same shit, yeah. you know, with uh, what I used to do. Um, but, but how long, um, you know, what was your family life like during this time? I mean, you sounds like you completely ruined almost all the relationships uh, within your team. 
What was family life like? So at that point when I left, I was still, um, I wasn't married yet. I just started dating uh, dating my wife at the time. We had been dating for some time, and it, that was all fine at that point because I was still a fireman doing the job. I was drinking a lot more than I normally did, but I was still a very outgoing guy. I had some problems that I was just trying to figure out on my own. Um, she was a safe place for me, um, and I shielded her from a lot of that. And unfortunately, somewhere along the line, I dropped that shield, and she got heavily exposed to it. And it and it um, it started affecting our family and everybody around us. And that was years years later. Um, but when I left the fire department, you know, I was already doing stand up comedy on the side for two years. It was like a, a, a part time job for me, mm -hmm. and I just threw myself into comedy the day that I left. I just threw myself into comedy and I was on the road six years straight for 40 weeks a year. And I was running from running from what made me sick, the place that made me sick, Charleston and everything that happened there and, and, and through my career. And comedy was like that adage, laughter is the best medicine. Comedy was like my crack cocaine. It just made me feel invincible and it made me feel amazing. And I couldn't get enough of it. It's the only thing that made me feel alive after everything inside of me had died. I'd always been a fun, outgoing guy, but when the f somewhere that, that switch got flipped and the old me was dead and I was this new version of Travis and now, just a soulless human being. How long did it take you uh, for the new version? Hmm. 13 years. 13 fucking years. Yeah. Damn, man. I mean, um, you know, just the fact that you, out of, of all the shit that you have been through and everything you've experienced, to turn it around and become a fucking stand-up comedian yeah, is, right. uh, I mean, that's that's a, like a miracle in itself. <laughs> well, it's like you, man. When you get passionate about something, I see what you do. And if you throw yourself into it and you give it everything you got, and that's how I am. I stopped at nothing and I created some opportunities for myself. Nothing was handed to me. I, I made things happen because that's what we do. And we don't make excuses. We just make shit happen. And I did get some, some decent breaks, but it's because I put myself in these positions for that to happen. And so comedy took off for me and it got, it turned into something amazing. And you know, as well as I do with this whole PTSD thing and uh, the depression, the anxiety, first thing we want to do is self-destruct. Yeah. You don't feel like you deserve it. You don't feel like you deserve anything. So I pulled the plug on it in 2016 and I just fucking walked away from it. You mentioned uh, some of the things that helped you and uh, you like very subtly mentioned, I can't remember if it was in a podcast or in your book or, or where I found it, but it resonated with me because one thing that I believe helped me, uh, kind of pull myself out is getting the fuck away from uh, the community for a minute. Yeah. And and the, it seemed like the farther that I leave it, the better uh, the better off I am. And then uh, it wasn't until, shit, to be honest with you, it wasn't until I started this fucking show uh, that I kind of started reconnecting uh, with some of the guys and and, uh, you know, I mean, I talked about going to Marcus Luttrell's with Rob and and Dave and how fucking tense that was. And I hated that, to be honest with you. I couldn't fucking stand being there uh, at first. And then, you know, and then the tension kind of wore off. But it, um, anyways, all I'm getting at is like, is the toxicity of being around um, and, and, and how it help, help, helped me get better and, and then to hear you say, being on the road, doing comedy, you were out of the firehouse. You weren't. You weren't in Charleston. You you weren't in communication with with the boys, and uh, and it accelerated your uh, your recovery. Well, yeah. Um, okay. Well, I mean, do you think that helped a lot getting out of there? Man, I, I always say. When you're in a place that makes you sick, you can't get better. It's like a cancer patient testing cigarettes for Marlboro or whoever. You're only going to get sicker. 
I tried to stay. I hung on tooth and nail, man. But I realized when I realized I had problems and something needed to change when I finally, because people ask me, what made you reach out for help? Yeah. You know, and it was me sitting in my living room, dry firing a weapon in my mouth while I'm choking on the, on the, on the weapon with the barrel down my throat with slobber and drool all over it. And my tears running down my face and a bottle of whiskey next to me. And then I load it and then I go to pull the trigger and I stop right where I thought it would go off. And, uh, luckily I stopped prior to it going off and I knew right then I needed help. So I got the help, but it wasn't in time, but yes, to answer your question, um, when I got away from the fire department, things started drastically changing for me. The, the anxiety, the, um, I always had the nightmare shit. I still do. Um, but that, that rage inside of you, it, it, it calms. So getting away from there was a, the best thing that could have ever happened to me. I didn't want to leave like that. I wanted to stay on the job 30 years. I wanted to be, I wanted to retire. I wanted to do the right thing for my guys, ride that rig for them. Um, but it wasn't in the cards for me. So I got away from there for a long time and now I'm back. And now I do a lot of work with fire departments, police departments, but I'm better now. And I'm, I'm with them at a different capacity now, you know, so I'm not completely immersed in it all the time. I can step away from it. Yeah. Yeah. When did you decide to put the bottle down? <laughs> That's the day after our wedding in uh, 2012. No shit. Yeah, man. I got so fucked up at our own, at our wedding that my my poor wife she um she had to eat cold grits with the uh, with the cab driver that took us to our hotel because her husband was passed out upstairs. Oh shit. Yeah, it was a great first night together. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> no, nah, but I I had been thinking about it for a while. That was just for me. That was just the thing. I woke up the next morning and I said, man, I, I don't ever want to touch this stuff again, and I haven't. Cold turkey. Yeah. Done. Yeah, I looked at it and I, I started looking at if I'm ever going to get better, it's going to it's going to be a long road to hope. But I need to look at the things I can control right now that are not helping me. And the biggest one that stuck out to me was alcohol. There was it it, it didn't add any positive thing in my life. Nothing. Yeah. Everything that it offered me was negative. So I was like, dude, just gotta go. Yeah. So I just I quit cold turkey right then. That's uh. That's not easy to do. No, but it's at first, you know, the hardest part about it is now being the sober guy around all the people that are drinking. Yeah. And you're sitting there when you, when you don't want to be there, like you talk about in your social anxiety posts, I get it because yeah. I don't want to fucking be here, but I have to put on this smile and that doesn't mean I'm not contemplating fucking everybody up in this room, you yeah. know? Um, but it's just something I've had to learn to, to accept. And, and, and deal with. And I'd rather have that than going back home with that bottle and putting myself in a position to not be here anymore. Yeah. Well, for, for everybody that's listening, who is from, you know, the fire service or military or police, who's fucking drowning themselves in a bottle right now. And there's a lot of them. I mean, how fast after you quit drinking did, how fast did that acceleration start? Uh, to get you into a better mental state. And and I'm sure your business fucking started taking off too at that point. Well, honestly, I'd love to tell you it was lightning fast, but it wasn't. It was a culmination of things because I was so fucked up. It, the biggest hurdle I had yet to face was ownership and acceptance of everything. Yeah. And I, I always was asking why, and it was I became the victim of like, this only happens to me, why me? My life is in such a horrible spot. Even though I wasn't drinking, I still had that mentality. And that's never who I was prior to all of this. I was a very positive, upbeat guy. But this thing does something to you. It rewires your brain. And you have to be your own surgeon and go in and fucking reconfigure the wire. It took years of me going in and trying to rewire until I finally fixed it. And it wasn't until um, last year when I realized what it was, it was something as simple as how the word is perspective, something as simple as perspective. How do I want to view my world? Do I want to look at it through this victim feeling bad, horrible, or fucking poor, poor me lens? Or do I want to look at it from a standpoint of, look, you have this beautiful life. You have these horrible experiences. Yes, but you can do something with them for the greater good. And you can make a positive impact on people 
with what you have experienced. And so I chose that. And the second I chose that, it was, it was like a light switch. Well, how the fuck did that come to you? That, that's funny you ask. It came to me sitting in my car with a gun in my hand, ready to blow my brains out for the second time. Um, so I quit comedy in 2016. I'd been on the road for six years. And uh, we had a we had a young daughter at home. And my wife was pregnant with our second one. And by this time, I was already doing tours overseas for the troops. I was headlining major comedy clubs all over the country. I was getting on television. I was doing all these things that I loved. And I thought, thought, hey, this is my purpose now is, is being a comedian. And this makes me better. But in the same token, I felt guilty for having any, any level of success. I don't pretend to be a household name. That's not what I'm trying to say. But I had success in my own right. And I felt horrible for it. And then at the same token... I now have a wife and kids at home and I felt horrible because I'm not there. And I tried to juggle the two and balance the two and I just couldn't get it right. So I quit. I pulled the plug on comedy. And uh, when I did, I, I started resenting everybody for that. I started resenting my own family. Like it was their fault that I chose to do this, you know, but I felt it's what I needed to do. And so for three years, I carried that and I, I worked around home flipping houses in real estate and I was doing, doing well, but I was empty inside. I was missing something. I was craving that stage and I was too ashamed to, to even try to go back because I had bowed out and I'd pretty much accepted a defeat. And this was my new life. And I was trying to force something that wasn't natural. And I was meant to be on a comedy stage. So one day I got in my car, I just couldn't live this life anymore. I was miserable. I, yet I have a family that loves me. Financially, I'm stable. I live in a fucking wonderful place, and I wanted none of it. I just wanted to die. All I knew was empty, and I just didn't want it anymore. So I went. I drove out to the to the forest on a rainy day, and I was sitting out there in my truck, and something happened that made me smile. And uh, when it did, I hadn't smiled in a long time, and I hadn't felt a sense of um, satisfaction or joy in a long time. And the second that happened, I threw my gun in the glove box. I said, I know what I need to do. I still have some joy left in me. And I realized it. And I said, I'm going back to work. I'm going back to get on the comedy stage. All these shitty things happened in my life. I can't fucking change it. But I'm going to make the fucking best of it. And it starts right now. And when I did that, that's when I opened up more about speaking. And I started getting speaking engagements on mental health. And I'd go up there and I'd cry like a fucking baby, just like I did on this show, because it's very, very, very difficult to talk about this stuff because you have to relive it. If you want it to be authentic, you have to relive it. Yeah. And I started doing that and I saw the impact that that was making. And I started seeing the, the responses I was getting from people was so overwhelming in our communities. Like, man, I'm going through the same thing. And hearing your message made me realize I need to get help. And it's touching other first responders and military families. And it's, I'm not saying that I'm the cure-all That's a, by any means. I'm not that dude. But I'm just willing to be fucking vulnerable now and share my experiences in hopes that my mistakes won't be made by others who are quickly approaching where I was. Well, it's working. I mean, you fucking put yourself out there and, you know, you're reaching a shit ton of people. So you're going to reach a shit ton more. And... uh People are buying your book, and and uh, I know that's helping a ton of people. And so you're doing fucking great work, man. Well, thank thank you, man. And it said this honestly means the world to me doing what I do now. Where I thought my purpose in life was comedy, but that's why I say our life is a bunch of redirecting points in our life. You think you're where you need to be, but you never know where you need to be. No, the universe. I'm not spiritual. I'm not. I'm not a religious. But I do know the universe will stop you when it's ready and point you in a different direction. And if you fight it, that's when your life is utterly fucking miserable because it's trying to tell you you needed to go this route. This is the way you go until I stop you and turn you somewhere else. And that's what happened with comedy. Yeah. It introduced me to speaking. And now I'm, I'm speaking all over. And it is a fucking wonderful feeling to be able to do what I get to do. And I couldn't be more blessed. That's awesome. Just going back just a little bit, we talked about the addiction to adrenaline and um, we were kind of talking the other night about, I asked you, I said, how do you, I was asking, how do you get your fix now? 
of adrenaline. I still have to fucking have it. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I get it in various ways, but comedy, jumping up in front of people on a stage and doing comedy, you, you had said kind of filled that void. And, uh, do you still have that now or, or with comedy? Yeah. Um, not as, it's not as big of a shot of adrenaline as it used to be, but it's still there because you are 100% at other people's mercy. And it, it feels good. It's like, all right, let's get this thing going, right? And yeah. it's, it's the whole make me laugh, motherfucker. And it's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> and you never know what you're getting. Comedy's wild, man. It can get pretty wild out there. And uh, with speaking, not so much because when you go to speak, it's not people obviously don't want you to suck, but it's a nice quiet calm crowd and you don't have drunk people out there like with this whole prove it mentality yeah. so speaking the adrenaline's not there comedy you still feel you still feel the pp about to come out sometimes you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think i've been thinking a lot about you know uh because i know you told me that you don't get the same adrenaline rush as you uh speaking as you do with the comedy or in, definitely not fighting fires but um just kind of thinking on it, how many people, how many people do you think you maybe have saved as a firefighter? Like pulling a baby out of a fire, pulling a woman out of a man. I don't know. How many people do you think you've saved? Have you ever thought about that? No, I never thought about it because you, you think about ones you couldn't. Yeah. That's, that's the truth. I've been involved in some stuff and um, that's, that's helped some people. But those are, I don't know. I mean, I hope that those folks go on to become wonderful people and do wonderful things in their lives. But it's it's ones that you can't get back that stick with you. Let me rephrase that. What is it like when you do save somebody and you know they would have fucking died if you had not responded? What's that feeling. feeling like? It's amazing. Do you get that fucking feeling now when you get an I email? See. Or somebody's somebody pulls you aside after the show. I mean, because now you're helping thousands and thousands and thousands of fucking people, and so That's you might not be right. getting your adrenaline fix, but you're getting that. You're getting another fix. I don't know what the hell you would call it. Satisfaction. But yeah. Yeah. So that is a very good way to 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 word that. I didn't realize when I first started speaking the power this thing had. I I knew that we had problems in our communities. You know, you hear it all the time, firefighter suicides, police suicides, and, and military. Military has been addressed for years and years and years. Maybe not as much as it needs to, but it's no secret the military has PTSD problems. Over the last few years, law enforcement, emergency services have hit the forefront too, where they were kind of left in the cold for a little while. And people are starting to realize, hey, they might be just as, if not more severely fucked up than the military yeah. because they live it for 30 fucking years, day in, day out, and they never get to leave it. So I knew what I had to say was important, but I had no idea at the magnitude of it. And when I started, it got addicting because, yeah, people come out of the woodworks and they want to share what they've experienced and they want to share. the. So many people are like, hey, man, because of your story, I realized I'm, I'm messed up and I need to get help to help my family too. And I've gotten, we've talked about this, about the emails that come through and the, it's an overwhelming feeling of, of, of gratitude that I can't explain. Yeah. Um, and it's, I look at my life and I feel like I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be because of everything that's happened. And I feel like now all of that stuff may have happened because maybe I am strong enough to weather it all and to package it up, own it and accept it and do something positive with it. Yeah. And I'm just taking it a day at a time. It's pretty fucking fulfilling, isn't it? It's amazing. But, uh, well, you're doing great now. And uh, I don't want to keep going down the dark road. So I want to take a break. And uh, and when we come back, we just got a quick thing and then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. This episode of The Sean Ryan Show is brought to you by Vigilance Elite Patreon. Vigilance Elite Patreon is how you support the show. 
It also has an entire library of tactical training and behind the scenes footage of the Sean Ryan show. Go to vigilanceelite.com, click the training tab. It'll take you right to Vigilance Elite Training on Patreon. Get a subscription, support the show. Thank you. Let's get on with it. All right, man. So once again, we are back from the break. We're going to wrap it up here pretty soon. But, um, you know, since you are in the business of uh, helping fellow firefighters and police and mill and and um, and everything like that, I have a personal friend uh, who works for Boca Raton Fire Rescue and uh, his name's Mike Sklark. He's getting ready to, he's uh, putting in for retirement, getting ready to, uh, you know, open up the next chapter of his life. And uh, I know he's, you know, seen a lot of fucked up shit too. In fact, uh, one thing that comes to my mind is I remember uh, going out to breakfast with him uh, when I lived in Florida. We used to go to breakfast together all the time. And um, <clears throat> he, responded to a call on an overpass and uh, I can't remember the specifics of who it was. I think it, he was a, I think he might've been a uh, truck driver, a tow truck driver, but um, he fucking fell off the damn overpass and, uh, you know, fucking died right there. And uh, an hour later, he's sitting there eating breakfast with me and uh, and his wife, and I think Katie was there too. And I remember thinking while we were eating breakfast, I was like, Jesus Christ, man, like how is this dude fucking kind of keeping it together, you know, playing playing husband and, and, you know, I'm just looking at him like, how the fuck are you pulling this shit off? You know, that's some heavy shit. Um, so anyways, uh, he's getting ready to retire and I uh, called him and told him that you were coming out here and and uh, and uh, who you are. And I know he's been researching you. And so I think he's got a question for you. And I thought maybe a transitioning firefighter coming out of the service, opening up his new chapter. I mean, who better to, you know, ask than you. So. Okay. Hey, Mike, you on here? Yeah, I'm here. Hey. Uh Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be uh, speaking with the two of you today. Well, thanks for coming on, man. Pleasure's mine, Mike. But uh, so I have uh, Travis here, and uh, we're getting ready to wrap it up. And and uh, so the floor is yours, man. Hey, first of all, I'd like to say, uh, Travis, you got a great interview over there. Uh, Sean's been around and. I don't think he'd bring anybody on that he didn't have high respect for, brother. So, welcome. Thank you. Hey, I, I just have to apologize. Yeah, I would like to have read your whole book. I just got it yesterday afternoon, but I've only got about 20 pages left. Uh, that's amazing. I'm just, I'm blown away that an individual can actually open up like that because a lot of us can't. And uh, very impressed. Very impressed. Thank you, man. You've, uh, you've had quite a journey, it looks like, along the way. And uh, some of us seem to be magnets for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you seem to be one of those magnets. My uh, my hat's off to you. Well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate your support, bro. Uh, I do have a question for you. Sure. Um, since you've written your book and you've uh, started doing comedy, it, it seems like you've really opened up and exposed these issues, not just in the fire service, police service, you know, also in the military and, and the day-to-day -day stress that gets the people. How often do you get a call from somebody saying, hey, I need help and I don't know where to start? Uh, I don't receive too many phone calls, but I get a ton of emails um, in inboxes, whether it be Instagram or Facebook. And it's now it's gotten to the point where it's sometimes it's multiple times a day and it's usually brothers and sisters in, uh, in the, in the services. And, uh, I've actually experienced many of them, um, are, are from actual family members of those, um, uh, individuals. So it's, uh, it's one of those things that, um, you know, I think when people hear it, they realize there's more of us out there and we don't have to sit here and shoulder all of this on our own. So it happens pretty frequently. 
Wow, that's uh, that's pretty impactful. I uh, when I was reading your book, I, I see you're friends with Jeremy Hurd. Yeah, I know Jeremy well. So here's what's funny. I'm I'm a face person. I'm not a name person. So when I read his name in your book, I'm like, well, let me look him up. And I knew his face right away because he did something for me, and I've only met him once. So you talk about that light bulb that comes on. Yes, sir. For years, when somebody's at a critical time, whether it's your family, somebody else's family, sometimes it's just showing up and being there for that person or that family, whatever they might need. For years, I could describe it, but I didn't have a name for it. And a friend of a co-worker uh, had passed away, and he was there. And he and I had a great conversation and everything, and I explained to him what I was feeling. He goes, oh, that's called the Ministry of Presence. And <laughs> I said, man, thank you so much. I have been looking for a name for that for the last 15 years. And uh, very impactful. Man, that's uh, that's good stuff, man. That's again, yeah, I'm I'm blown away. It, uh, but like you like you said, and I see some people get it, some people don't. Uh, it's about relationships. That's, I think that's what it all boils down to. That's exactly right. And unfortunately for so many of us, we ruin those relationships before we ever get to really build them and strengthen them to, to the, you know, the best ability that we can. And unfortunately, in my case, I'm certainly speaking for me, I've ruined a lot of those and I've spent a lot of time repairing them now. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really happy that you've come out ahead. Uh, in recent years, there, there have been a lot of brothers and sisters that haven't. You know, and they've they've fallen just you know by their own hand, and uh, it's tough. It's tough for all of us in the community to shoulder. But uh, man, I can't I can't tell you. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn more guys on to uh, your book, and uh, I'll really help try to get the word out there. I, I don't think it's as common as a lot of people think that people understand. There's more support out there for them, but uh, just phenomenal. Well, I, I appreciate that, bud. Yeah, you know, it, it means the world, and that's what it's about. It's about leaning on one another, helping one another out, whether that means putting the right literature in front of guys, uh, turning them on to someone who is talking about it openly and vulnerably to show them that, hey, you two, you know, you hear this guy's story. Maybe it's not mine. Maybe it's somebody else's, but we got to be we, – we, we preach the word brotherhood, and Sean and I were talking about this – it sounds a lot cooler than what it really is sometimes because sometimes it doesn't exist. We want it to, but in order for that to exist, we really got to lift one another up. And that's where it starts. It starts with, with, with lifting each other up. Yeah. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, I think in a lot of industries, they don't, uh, it's hard. Most people just go to a job every day. They work that job for eight hours. They come home. They don't actually live with the people. I think when you when you live with a crew or you have a job or you're extended and you depend that much on somebody, whether it's your life or just anything in the day to day or you're instrumental in each other's lives like that, yeah. There's that there's that tight bond that forms. And uh it's it's no joke. It's no joke. Yeah, it's, and it, it gets you through. Yeah, it's an unexplainable bond that uh if you haven't lived it, you, you just don't know. It's a beautiful thing. Absolutely. I see you've also spoken at uh, FDIC. That's uh, that's a huge room. Well, I haven't I haven't spoken at FDIC. I I performed um, comedy events there, and I have another one coming up in 2021, and it's for the actual um, Firefighter Cancer Support Network. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Another big issue facing a lot of us these days. Yeah, it is, and that's why it's. Uh, you know, cancer, it's getting the best of a lot of us. And, uh, you know, we, we don't, we just don't know, um, from the way that I was brought up in the fire service, we did, we did everything wrong. And at some point it inevitably catches up with many of us. And that's why I, I, I took a real hard look at myself and said, I'm going to make the most of, of the time that I have left, however much that may be. And I'm going to put my pride to the side and, and start opening up about this stuff and talking about it. And hopefully it, it makes a difference. And I'm, I'm, 
so pleased to be a part of the Firefighter Cancer Support Network for four years now, doing shows for them to help help our brothers and sisters. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Thank you for all you do. Really appreciate it. Thank, yeah, thank you for what you do, man. People would say thank you for your service. We really need people like you in the community. It's uh, not everybody can do the job. Hey, you get people that come into the military. They may be very short lived. They may not even make it through boot camp. I'm sure you've seen those. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean Police and firefighting, everybody's different. Everybody's wired different. It takes a special person. Yeah. Well, it does, man. I, I appreciate your service. And like I say, when people thank me for mine, it, honestly, it is the pleasure of my life. It really, it really has been. So and as you transition out, man, I, I wish you nothing but the best in your transition out. And I hope you turn the page and, and have a wonderful, wonderful retirement, bro. Thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, hey, again, thank you guys for having me today. It's, it's been amazing. Yeah, Mike. When are you going back to work? Uh, I go back tomorrow. All right, man. Stay safe, brother. Be safe out Stay there. Grind. Thank you so much, guys. Thank Take you. Take care. Thanks. You too. Bye-bye. You guys in this phone already. What's that? You guys in this phone. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks for taking that call. I mean, I, yeah. it's my pleasure. He's a good friend of mine, and uh, I know he is really. He's. I think he's scared of uh, you know leaving the community. Yeah. And what it's going to be like uh, putting that behind him, and uh, we've talked several times about it. And so I just thought you're paving the way. You know. It's scary because it's it doesn't have to be the end, you know? Yeah. And for me, it was hard when I left. I left it on not on my own terms, and it was just the end. But it doesn't have to be. You know, you just turn the—our book, I like to think our, our, our life is, is a book with multiple chapters. It's not just one chapter. And being in the fire service, being in the SEAL teams, being a police officer, that's just one chapter, no matter how thin or thick it is. At some yeah. point, it's going to end. Yep. And you can't let that define who you are as a human being. And that's what crushes people at the end. And that's what puts these folks in in these positions where they feel like they have nothing left because they let that job define them. And now they they have this emptiness inside. But I'm telling you, I've had that same emptiness. And you just have to go and create your own light. Yep. Well, you're doing a hell of a job at paving the way, man. I, you really are. And um, on that note... <laughs> I want to kind of wrap this thing up and, um, but I just, you know, I, w I just want to say, um, you know, you're the first mill guy or the first non mill guy, even though you are a mill guy, but we didn't focus on that. And, um, <clears throat> and, uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sure how this was going to go. And, uh, but when I announced that you were coming on the show, uh, just, you know, for just so you know what your own are saying about you, we got a shit ton of emails, messages, comments, and uh, everybody, a ton of people know who you are. A lot of people are calling you a legend uh, in the fire community. And uh, it's just been a real honor to, you know, pull your story out of you and, and have you sit in that fucking chair, man. Like, that's heavy words, man. And, and I, thank you. But I, legend, I don't know about that. It's not, yeah. it's, I, I've, I've walked amongst legends. Ricky Williams is one that you fucking talk to. I'm just trying to do what I feel is right in my heart to help, you know, um, help guys and girls stay in the fight as long as they can. And, and and I can't thank you enough for having me on your platform, for sharing this with me. I know you said a lot of bad motherfuckers have sat in this chair, and I told you that. <laughs> I'm not one of them. Yeah, and you I, are. I feel, like, I feel like I'm staining this chair. So You I, might be. I've but... seen the dudes you've had on this show, and I'm— you know, and it's an honor to sit here. It really is with you, with your crew, with your wife, your family. So thank you. And thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. And, uh, you know, taking a compliment is not a fucking easy task. It's almost like a joke, right? Yeah. If you can take a, if you can take a. If you can take a dick. There you go. You can take a joke. That's exactly right. But uh, I did want to say <laughs> a couple of things. And um, we at Vigilance Lead have given a ton uh, to the veteran community, um, donations, connections, uh, all kinds of stuff. We we gave to the law enforcement community. Um, 
<clears throat> I actually I made a, a, a piece of apparel and donated all the proceeds back to law enforcement. And uh, I've been really wanting to do something for the fire community as well. But, um, you know, unfortunately, as time goes on, I have lost faith in just about every fucking nonprofit out there. There's only one that I actually vouch for anymore. Yep. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, I'm going to make a, a, uh, a, a fire service hat the thin red line, um, which by the time this airs, it'll be out. So the links up top, you can click the link, buy the hat. I'm going to give you all the proceeds, uh, from the hat. So, um, I don't know how many we're going to make yet, but I'm going to give you all the proceeds. I don't know a good organization to donate it to, but, um, I want to give you the proceeds and, you do with it what you think is necessary, whether it's donating to a nonprofit or uh, buying an, as many of those books that you wrote as you can and get them at every fucking fire station in the country. Whatever you think you need to do, all I ask is just tell us where it went and uh, and uh, if there's have been any results. So I just, you know... I think you're a stand-up motherfucker, dude. I know it takes balls to do what you're doing, paving the way like that, and uh, I just want to help. So we're going to have that done. I don't even know what to say because, like I told you before when we were just chatting, nobody's ever done anything for me, you know, like to to help do what I do. And I just told you downstairs, I've, everything I do is, is by myself. I will certainly put that to use to do some good in these communities. And I can't thank you enough from the bottom of my heart, for real. I, I have some ideas and we can talk about that. Um, but wow, that's that's tremendous, man. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm just gonna need some help designing it. I don't wanna uh I don't wanna put anything on it that shouldn't be on there, but uh but yeah, the design will be catered uh a hundred percent towards uh, your community. So thank you. That'll and be then, fucking awesome. And they'll certainly appreciate the fuck out of it, man. Cool. We'll make sure that, that it goes to the right places. I know you will. And, uh, with that being said, if somebody wanted to reach you on social media, your website, how do they get a hold of you? Is it, do they still call uh nine one one or just, yeah, you just call nine one one for Travis, man. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's uh, I'm pretty simple, man. Just it's my name. It's my website, uh, Travis House H O W Z E dot com. But I'm asking everybody because when I quit comedy, I deleted most of my social media, so I've been a pain in the ass to rebuild it. And I'm asking folks to inundate Instagram. I, I'm just focusing on Instagram, so give me a follow at Instagram at uh, Travis House H O W Z E. I'd really appreciate the fuck out of it. Um, because the more people that I can get in my corner, the more we can spread this message and hopefully help some folks out. You know, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And uh, if they want to buy your book. Yeah. So if they want to buy my book, Create Your Own Light, it's um, it's available on Amazon. Um, Amazon kind of fluctuates on the price. They'll drop it on sale sometimes. You just go click the link and grab it. It's getting a ton of great reviews. We have... Uh, I'm surprised at the amount of books that, that, that have been sold. And like I said in the beginning, I, I didn't expect this. And it's doing tremendously well. And I just believe it's because it's such a specific message for our communities that has not, no one's, no one's talked about it. And it's, it's, it's time. We're, it's much, much needed and, and long overdue. So you can go to Amazon and grab that. Um, it's the best place. Right on, man. Well, keep paving the way and uh, doing good things. And uh, best of luck to you. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it.